Okay, everyone. So we, uh, what an amazing morning we've had. Uh, phase one to the amazing Sukuta and then the fantastic lecture. Uh, we're about to start the, the main acts, really. Um, the graduating cohort of master students um, going to tell us everything we want to need to know about the field station, the fantastic project that's just been completed. I think it's important to say that this was a group's work um, and it's been kind of going for say nine months and, and the MSC graduating cohorts played an important part and uh, these three lovely students had the pleasure to uh, finalize it and then kind of complete it. So um, without any further ado, Numa. Hello. Thank you everyone for coming today. Um, so my name is Roman, and along with Yulin and Malu, we'll be presenting to you the latest project coming out of Design and Make, along with some personal projects. Uh, so this uh, latest build coming out of Design and Make is uh, the field station. And kind of to give you a little bit of context beforehand, um, we were arriving kind of at the end of this pandemic, and we were given kind of this opportunity to live on site. So that sort of meant that our whole world revolved uh, in and around a book. And that meant that we were actually living, working, studying, making, and doing everything on site. Um, could become quite intense at times, but uh, that's sort of what gave, uh, what triggered kind of where, where the field station is today. So before, uh, so just to give a general overview of today's presentation, We'll have just a general look at what the field station is about, um, along with its harvesting plan and roundwood growth. Um, and then why we'll be able to do a robotic demonstration, just to have a little bit of understanding of how complex uh, the roundwood braces were actually made. Um, and then after this, we'll be able to get into more depth and detail of uh, the field station in itself. So looking at the prototyping development throughout the months, uh, the proof of concept, uh, for, which is a fourth and fifth prototype, um, and then looking into uh, the final build, so prototype number seven, being the field station, uh, and its off-grid assembly, and finally its uh, lidar scan analysis. So at this point, we'll be able to have a little bit of a conversation together about the field station in its entirety. Um, and then Nalu will be able to present afterwards the pod, which is right behind you. Um, and Yulin will speak more about the landscaping of the field station. And then I'll finish off the whole with uh, the long-term projections and maintenance speculations of the field station. And if weather permits, uh, we'll be able to walk down to the field station. Maybe no sunset, but um, at least a little bit of visibility would be nice. There are some uh, uh, space blankets, just in case it gets really, really rainy um, to protect ourselves. We can reuse them afterwards, so it's all fine. Um, but yes, so at the end of our first term, so December of 2021, we were briefed with kind of two strands of research. Firstly was the, um, uh, the tetrahedral structure for a small roundwood diameter, which turned into this uh, currently the hybrid space frame. So this was something that we were quite interested uh, or that kind of developed quite naturally throughout, throughout our conversations with the engineers, with Arab. Um, it turns into now this exploration of hybrid applications of wood, uh, both round and engineered. Uh, the tree fork support that came kind of afterwards, knowing that having our extensive roof, uh, we could then be able to support it and transfer the load onto the ground. And the glue laminated pod uh, comes from the second strand of research being uh, the glue laminated chassis. So Bella will be able to talk about much more depth and much more complexity uh, afterwards. And yes, yeah, so this, this was really a project that happened throughout uh, nine months. So it was a group of 10 students all together um, being able to build uh, off grid, uh, which is something that we really wanted to emphasize on because I guess once you were living on site, uh, we realized the bubble was quite small um, and we wanted to, sort of make 
uh, students realize a little bit more that you could engage with the woodland and the idea of having it further out, which we're sort of up here by the ridge, um, having it further out by this main path uh, for the visitors of Hook kind of meant that you could have this engagement both with uh, AA students or uh, Hook students and uh, non-AA or non-campus students or visitors, sorry. Uh, so as you can see here, the main, the main path with the field station and uh, the main campus being here, uh, we were we communicated this um, harvesting contract to the to the harvester in at the start of May, and this actually just became our our map to be able to source uh, our roundwood. So typically understood or used or not pretty much unused, uh, used as forest uh, forest waste. So usually tend to to be left on the forest floor, uh, left to decay. Um, but this is where kind of the complexity and the, the charm of the space frame and the field station comes in is we were using this, this forest waste and deploying it within the structural system of uh, the space frame. And kind of this comparison of looking at it from uh, the forest floor to its final destination in between the, the engineered ash cords. Um, so of course it's this is one, only one single roundwood piece out of the 256 that we have in this final uh, prototype. Oh, um, and yeah, so we wanted to ensure that throughout all of these prototyping or throughout all of these cuttings that we were, we, that we were making with the robot that uh, Wyatt actually developed the script for, uh, we would maintain this precision uh, throughout knowing that uh, we were working with natural geometries. So that meant that there was quite a complexity in terms of uh, keeping this precision, knowing that especially um, 256 of them would somewhat be compromised with our bare hands. <laughs> but I think now if uh, Wyatt can, um, we'd like to do a little robotic demonstration and uh, just have a little better understanding of how it actually works. Yes, yeah, so the first, uh, the first few prototypes were all done by hand. Uh, we were doing all of the round wood uh, by hand, so routing them by hand, which uh, Jin, who's behind the camera right now, did a jig for. Um, and then from the prototype four onwards, we were using uh, the robotic workflow. Um, and that was, now the presentation doesn't work. Yeah, okay. Um, and that was sort of our, yeah, that was our proof of concept, our driver, because we had to make quite quick decisions in a short period of time uh, for the projects review. So this was a, a moment where we would be able to exhibit uh, the prior year's work and we use the field station or this, uh, this prototype to be able to exhibit the work uh, underneath. Uh, so again, it was, it's, it's the same building, the same structure, but they were built in two different ways, let's say, or assembled in two different ways, mainly because there was a spatial constraint. Uh, so the first challenge being uh, at Hook Park, uh, just understanding or knowing if the building or the structure was actually gonna stay up uh, and withstand uh, all, of its, uh, all of its weight. Uh, so we had much more space to maneuver with the telehandler to place uh, the space frame on top of the, the tree forks. Uh, but then the other challenge, once we had to uh, dismantle it and uh, bring it all the way to London and assemble it in the new yard of the main campus, uh, just had a, yeah, another set of challenges where uh, much more constrained and we used instead of uh, the telehandler, of course, because we didn't have that space. Uh, we used the genie lifts to uh, lift the space frame uh, vertically and to be able to slide in uh, the tree forks afterwards and finally um, lower it down and screw them all together or bolt them all together. Uh, that gave us a lot of confidence in understanding how to build the, basically the space frame. Um, and in the end, uh, we shifted from this 24 square meters uh, from the project's review to the current 90 square meters that we have, uh, that we have on site. Um, and we also knew that at that point, we, had the, we were going to have the help of summer builders. So 10 people coming in for 10 days uh, to help us uh, build all the components needed for 
uh, the space frame. So we were very well, very well aware that um, we needed all of these people to be able to achieve that, uh, that scale, uh, which again, sounds, sounds big, sounded big already for us, but then once we were actually building it, it felt even bigger, or <laughs> <laughs> felt quite crazy. Um, so there's this, this aspect of the flat packability of the space frame. So what we did for uh, the project review, in fact, we were able to all fit it into a, a Luton van, and in fact, took very little space in, inside it. Um, and this, uh, this drone, drone shot that you can see here is all of the, the components that were needed for uh, the 90 square meter um, field station. So now looking a bit more into the, the main components of the space frame or of the field station, uh, some general numbers. So a total of 256 roundwood braces, uh, 342 cords, 275 keystones, 12 node connectors, 79 splice brackets, three tree fork heads, and six tree fork feet. Um, Looking a little bit more in those in those details that I'll not um, get into right now, but kind of demonstrating the idea that we had uh, to fabricate all of these pieces or most of these pieces or assemble them together at least. Um, and another sorry interesting number is uh, if you total all the amounts of uh, roundwood beach that we actually have it's around 350 meters um, and in terms of our engineered ash cords almost a kilometer which as uh, probably pretty close to the distance that we're gonna have to walk to um, the field station, maybe even more. Um, so looking into some of these components, the, skis, the keystone is uh, kind of operates as this uh, spacer well, as we were assembling the space frame, but it also actually has a structural, um, has structural capacity because it's uh, transferring the loads uh, from the roundwood braces onto the engineering cords and ensuring that um, this, the, 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 the spacing between the cords remains even throughout. So as you can see here, one of the conditions during assembly actually was that we needed to um, slide in the, the roundel brace at the same time as we were assembling the, the engineered cords because of the length of these um, notches. So we had a lot of like back and forth within the assembly where, you know, if you forgot one or two roundwood braces, you actually had to dismantle the whole thing again, or that, that grid to be able to fit in your, <laughs> your roundwood brace. So we learned that a lot uh, after the first three or four days. Um, but then looking into the node connector, these were um, occupying a bit more of a space within the metal corner. They were all individually welded together uh, with all of these components individ individually manufactured to us. Um, and oh man, uh, so we had a lot of conversations with Arif, uh, knowing that uh, each of the cords or each of the tension rods were going to be under a different amount of, uh, of have different loads, uh, different loads. So what the node connector does is that surrounding the area of the three four. Uh, support, uh, we have an increased diameter of roundwood just because the loads are higher. And this is where the node connectors actually operate uh, so that they can welcome much, a much higher load. Uh, the splice brackets um, give us the possibility to uh, increase the lengths of, uh, of the cords, mainly because either uh, the existing length of our of our timber was uh, around five meters. And of course the, the sawmill shelter reaching a maximum length of around five meters too. Um, yeah, so as you can see here, the tree fork head uh, is quite specific. So it's, it's the moment where you have the transferring of loads uh, from this uh, horizontal sandwich to the vertical uh, and onto the ground. Uh, there's actually only three points of contact with uh, the space frame. So we wanted, uh, with our conversations with Arab, we were really trying to, to push as much as possible uh, the, the working of, uh, of the space frame. And so each of these uh, points of contact are paired with another, uh, another tree fork uh, to complete this uh, triangulation. 
the tree fort foot uh, was also another important aspect because as we were um, putting the uh, screw piles in place, uh, there was still a certain uh, shift between uh, the placement digitally and the final placement. So with the development of a script, we were able to uh, reposition the actual position of the screw piles, put it back into a digital model and be able to recalibrate uh, the positioning of the tree fort to make sure that uh, as we were placing them on site, we could maneuver them or tilt them or pivot them uh, within the cylinder to ensure that they were pretty much in place. Um, which brings us actually to uh, the final assembly. So I like to call it off-grid because there's literally no source of uh, power. Um, and the first few days were quite uh, complicated in terms of really realizing or understanding what, what were the materials we actually needed. And if, um, if we didn't actually have them, we'd have to come back here to uh, collect or recollect them. Uh, so, in general, just in terms of the choice of our site, again, it's further out in the forest. Um, it's along the main path of, of Hook Park. So this is the most frequented uh, path from uh, non-Hook uh, residents, or some more for, from the visitors. And just kind of looking at this uh, comparison between uh, right before we did any kind of work on site to its final uh, fully built um, structure with a bit of a staircase uh, of a ladder floating in space. <laughs> um, so it took us a total of 10 days to assemble the space frame. Uh, we decided to build it on site or off grid because it gave us the possibility or through the research or the possibility to uh, have it lifted uh, into the final placement where the tree, the tree forks are, are placed. So we had to position this, um, this domino structure that you can see here as operating as our um, platform to ensure that we had as flat of a surface as possible to uh, assemble the, the cores. Uh, so as you can see here, so this is basically from uh, the fourth till the 10th day uh, in pictures, but in this, uh, in this animation, it's kind of, all of the steps we've been through through each of the days. And this was kind of extracting this information from these master plan drawings, sketches that we were using to communicate with one another at that point. So there were a lot of things that were still unsure for us um, when we were building, assembling, mainly because it was a scale that we still didn't, we weren't aware of. Um, and the conditions being off grid were, yeah, of course, uh, quite unpredictable. <laughs> So on day 11, I think it was like the fourth day when uh, the phase one students arrived. Um, and yeah, it was a super exciting day. It happened over the course of three or four hours. I think the, the setup took two hours for it to be placed. And with the help of the crane, crane people, um, we were lifted into place uh, within 20 minutes. Uh, so there was a slight tilt as we positioned it. Uh, the tallest people in the in the forest, which were Emmanuel and uh, Wyatt, were able to saw off a little part of the notch of the tree fork, and finally rested in place uh, without any single cracks or squeaks. Uh, to our surprise. Yes, exactly. Um, so. From September on, uh, once the MSC students left, we, uh, especially Yulin and I, have been uh, finishing off this build. Um, of course, less people means a uh, longer period of time. Uh, also, colder weather and muddier days means a uh, much longer time to move scaffolds in place to place the, the roofing sheets. Uh, we had the help of phase one students also to uh, build the structure of the of the decking um, and since December early December uh, it's been officially considered finished um, and we're super excited to have you see it um, but looking a little bit at a, at a comparison between um, 
the physical build and the LiDAR scan that was able to be done uh, mid-December. Um, we kind of noticed that between this digital model and uh, the final build that there's a three uh, degree pivot horizontally and uh, vertically uh, there is a one degree uh, slope to little. Um, but I think it's quite interesting to just see how like this as a as a post analysis of construction, uh, even within any kind of um, constructions uh, outside, just to sort of see how these uh, these buildings actually shift or how you imagine uh, them in reality and how they actually turn out um, afterwards. Um, yes, I think at this point we are pretty much we've wrapped up uh, the um, the whole field station. I think if everyone's up for it, we can already just have a conversation about this, or if not, we can move on to uh, the pod. And I think it's it's three thirty. I think if we want to make the sunset at four thirty, um, it would be nice to to head down at around four. I think to make sure that there's some inside light. Um, but yes, it's really up to you if you wanna. Uh, there's a lot of like uh, things popping in your head already. We can first have a conversation about the field station. Yeah. Everyone's gonna have to start shouting. Gosh. Can you guys hear me actually? Yes. Oh, the, the deviation that yeah. you found, yeah. like you've said it's a few degrees off, but yeah. do, you, do you mean that from the points on the floor are correct and then the roof is twisted? Yeah, exactly. But is it, you, did you find where the twist comes in the, in the forks or in the roof? Or? Yeah, we, we think, we suppose it's from the farther, the farther tree fork, because when you were actually lifting it into place, there was a moment where it was, uh, it was coming in contact with the knot. And so that's when uh, Emmanuel and why it started full sawing the, the notch a little bit so that it could be it could fit. So it's it's in fact yes, the positioning of the tree fork, one of the tree forks that was slightly tilted, which meant that the opening or the notch was slightly tilted for the space time to actually fit. There's um, no real deviation in space time because that was yeah. half, half really because of all the legs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Superimposing the the space frame on top of one another, it's actually all all too too close. Squeaky clean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do, you, do you know what deflection arc we're expecting? Um, deflection or yeah, just under its weight. You know. Yeah. So I, it was so there's a a temporary support that's. That was needed to be put in place. Oh, as back as you yeah. can see here. Yeah. It's kind of the first thing that you see as you arrive to the field station. <laughs> but uh, there was sort of something that they had considered from the start. They knew that there was going to be some sort of sway, especially right. with the wind. Uh, but I think there were, their main uh, issue or main um, concern was if there would be like some sort of vandalism happening, that if the, the frequency would be too, too high, then potentially the the whole structure could, could fall apart. So that was just like a more of a measure for concern. Um, I mean, yeah. in terms of looking at when it was just sat there and we scanned it, yeah. obviously it has a, the, your 3D model is perfect. Yeah. And the roof itself will sit down on the gravity. Yeah. Do you know if it matched? What was yeah. expected? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. it, it, it matched. The and I think that's, yeah, I guess that's from the redundancy of the space. Yeah. Is, is, is there any um, diagonal bracing in plan? Uh, in plan, no, no, no. So it's all uh, it's all a grid, um, orthogonal grid. Uh, right on the on the joints, exactly. Yeah. Right, yeah. Moment joints mm -hmm. in plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you you have a combination of of um, the of these pieces yeah. where where you you've got the continuous fiber of the wood. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, um, 
the, the, the horizontal scrolls mm -hmm. are uh, dimensional lumber. Yes. Where yep. you're cutting, you're cutting through the fibers. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Strategically, is, yeah, this, yeah, yeah. is this is this a yeah, good thing? So I, yeah, um, at least what what happened with with the whole process, I think it's something that just sort of develops throughout the months. Um, but what we were also looking the whole concept of uh, compensation is to also just reduce the amount of waste of the whole concept. So actually a lot of what you find at the field station right now is uh, around 75% of the, the food concept project is built in London. It's actually found over there. It's like you can edit it and you can cut them off. But it's actually so to go through a set of um, small scripts to maximize all of the next timber that we have so that we ensure that the end of 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 the end to to what this sort of would right. um, So, for, for instance, you said that you use the state supported from three points. Maybe a project or reference twice. We would check we would attack on a conroy by Hang on, hang on, structure if you like. But first of all, like when. Um, we distribute the load of, of the main platform so that you don't get concentrated loads in the place. And um, instead of being um, effectively maxed, we make some knot um, as a joint where, where wood is it's not great in the mechanical connection, for instance. So just, just one, just wondering, is there a capacity of these pieces to do more if they, for instance, they branched out from the trees? Yeah. And, um, and did you give you such long years plants? Yeah, this were for those among our first group, I think, when we had this, Was kind of generation seven where the incrementally resolved kind of issue from time to time. So it was very hard to develop a tension joint in, in a single one tension yeah. and one compression out of timber. 
that's why I was wondering about the Waxman mm -hmm. connection mm -hmm. as well, where, where instead of instead of having having to rely on bolts and mm -hmm. so on, you know, if you could invent wedges or right. other sorts of processes where 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 the wood the wood does it what wood wants to do rather mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. what it doesn't want to do. Or, right. Right. Yeah, yeah. I'm, just, I'm being picky because it's, you know, it's, a, it's an amazing thing, <laughs> I like, but just, just just trying to understand the, uh, the, the thought behind it. I think the other yeah. thing is also maybe if you started out, um, it wasn't going to be a good thing, it was going to be some recombination. So the top and bottom of these cords had to almost uh, be able to take finishes. Right. So they had to okay. be able to take sheet materials. Right. And also for the reason, so I made it very much easier to stick a screw through the, the concrete as well. Metal onto a nice mm -hmm. straight bit of cord rather than a round one as well. Uh, yeah. sort of the slight bit of practicality. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, 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 the um, you know, you using using bits of wood that wouldn't otherwise be used seems like a very nice, uh, very nice discipline. I guess it could probably just you know, play with one of these things off and off and you know, use the round wood and just uh, yeah, make a nice flat edge on one side. Mm -hmm. That's it. But I think the straightness would be problematic in the current design because you. I think that was where I would want it for you. And if it mm -hmm. was, it would be like finding long enough holes would be, I think, quite mm -hmm. quite challenging mm -hmm. for this type. I guess if you, if you've made the assumption you're going to have an orthogonal grid, then you. I think you lend yourself towards dimensional timber. Mm -hmm. um, or, or, or that you know, taking your model where you need sort of a flat socket, for instance. Where if, if if you if you then use use that structurally, if you had a sheet of plywood mm -hmm. as as the as a tension cord, um, that would that would that would stiffen it in a good plan, a diagonal plan, as well as being um, the tensile member in every direction. I think thinking of things like um, in in the um, piano um, IBM pavilion. Where the polycarbonate pyramids act, act as the triangulation, for instance, you, know, you, you just have a flat sheet of plywood doing doing a similar similar sort of work. Hi guys, <laughs> hello. hello. <laughs> so um, we heard about the first part of the presentation, which is the field station, and the pod is a part of this. So before I get into the project, I'd like to sort of introduce the team behind it. So we're, we're a group of three, two MSCs and one MRC. And um, this is uh, Yao Lin, that's Hank, and then that, that's me, Malu. <laughs> so I'm gonna start off, before we get into the structure in general, I'm gonna start off with how we came up with the shape and the general layout of the entire pod. So my aim was to like create a space that responded to the user rather than provide a pre-made space with basic necessities, providing the scope for spaces to accommodate substantial changes, to provide flexibility or minor shifts in planning, to provide opinions for significant visual or spatial changes in the small given area to facilitate additions to the quantity, quality and a uh, possible quantity of space in a building. The capacity of a living area to accommodate effectively and efficiently the evolving demands of its context, thus maximizing its value through a long period of time. So our aim was, since we were three people who were very strong-minded and we had a lot of requirements that we wanted to put in and while also talking to the rest of our cohort the all 10 of us together we had a lot of requirements in the beginning and i wanted to create a space that is flexible to all the needs and that could probably possibly accommodate with minor changes in shifting of the interior spaces giving more space or giving a proper study or etc so i think when we move on you guys can understand a bit more so this was like a small interior articulation space that I had drawn up with several possibilities of, um, how do I say, flexibility, adaptability, and um, space conforming typologies. So different flexible areas like the study. The um, So we wanted to initially create a tiny pod um, like a living module, which sort of developed later on as our brief changed 
to a more of a leisure workspace too. Um, but this is one of our initial stages of our interior layout. And so we had different requirements. When I say different requirements, as in I wanted a space where I can actually, I know coming here once in a while, it's a beautiful space. It's still a beautiful space, but sometimes you just wanna, living here for 16 months, I'd like to like, even though move around in here, the given space, I, I would also prefer moving around inside the forest and just like sort of like a mini escape from our escape. So I wanted a space where I could just go sit, work, read. I read a lot, I read a lot of books and I just wanted a space where I could enjoy myself. Also feel a little bit more content with and use all the space that's already here and fully utilize whatever is given to us. So I wanted a space like that. My group mate, she wanted, she was a, how do I say, a proper stargazer. You can just find her out in the night, just looking at the sky at any point of the day. She loves doing that from her room. She had a, when we were living in the Westminster, she had the perfect room with the perfect view. Yeah, so when it comes to personal sanctuary planning, when it, when it came to the space articulation of the personal space, providing variable uses in the small given space, creating a flow between the structure and the furniture, giving different visual access, and if possible, to give a dimensional view of the whole space. The flow of movement of the user was of great relevance here. So a, flexi a flexible study space that could be opened up or closed up for more movement areas where areas while providing a great view into the woods an elevated resting space that also gave access to the cocoon structure for a very personal sky gazing experience and also provide ample convertible storage space below so to be able to create a small sanctuary space that could reflect the mind and the mood of its user so anyway our main aim was to retain the interior layout that provided the basis of the shell design maintain the shell design and develop it into a further step and make the production of the cells a little easier and practical and when i say the sentence i guess once i talk about the evolution of the shape you guys will understand what i mean by make it a little easier so before so these are some mood exploration of the pod like throughout the process of analyzing and finding solution deciphering what emotion or what feeling one would have while being inside the pod or near its surrounding was a very important factor so how one views the pod and what they view from inside the pod was of utter importance and i made a few sketches in an attempt to derive the emotional imagery of the same using different textures and different timelines so um the first row is the view of, view towards the field station how one would experience the field station from inside and view of the night sky. And from the forest to the pod, the window framing the whole situation. And this, this also sort of represents the uh, woods and the pod structure. So towards the end, when I show you some images, you guys can relate to this image, especially. So coming to the structure. So in, in our initial conversations during our design build, um, the conversation of a chassis came into the topic and we kept, so we sort of got fixated on it and we kept that as our ba like core principle um, precedent and, how, and we developed from that. So this was, this was the first stage of, how do I say, point one stage of the pod. And this, this, from this is what we developed into what you see over here. So the initial stage of the cell had around 24 plus cells, which were connected individually using steel plates. And later on, we started, we were very, uh, in the beginning, Roman was talking about the tetrahedral structure, which was the first um, core, how do I say, a modular pro thing we, our, our group worked on. And so we, when we got fixated into that, we were trying to develop a shell from a core joint. So, and from that, I think that was one of our first prototype, how we tried to make a joint and then produce a cell from that. And then, you know, you guys can see the different stages of the cells we went through. 
uh, and we were basically concentrating on connecting from joint to joint. And we made a small, how do I say, a judgment error of seeing it as a whole, but we, we saw it from one point instead of seeing it as a whole. And that's what we sort of learned in the process. So taking a cue from our senior cohort, the Wakeford Hall Library, uh, I hope you guys have seen it. Um, we wanted to explore the glue lamp connections, but using sort of a different approach, uh, connection to connection instead of a cross structural form that is the Wakeford Hall. And we wanted something different from that, but we still wanted to sort of explore the glue lamp structure of it. Um, and for that, so we started off by making a model in a smaller scale with the same properties of Wakeford Hall, and then cross-examining how we can move on to our values of this. So this is how we started off with the pod exploration and the shape design of it from a very basic rectangle and making creating joints from instead of using joints to create a cell. So we started from our first stage was starting from inside out and then our later on stage was starting from outside in. So that's how we sort of went about it. So from a complicated first shell design that had 24 cells, we sort of went through a journey and reduced it down to 12 cells with keeping all our principles intact. So when, um, for our uh, projects review, uh, the, the space frame had a flat back structure and we had the model that you see over here. This is what we made. So uh, this is our initial prototype of it. So this, we call it the turtle for, kind of looks like a turtle. <laughs> and um, so this, it's through the tur uh, turtle we created the discipline and the routine or the root map of how we were going to build the, po the pod. So I, I'm just gonna explain the method of how we went into this. So the goal was to like create a visually striking piece uh, of design which has both properties of beam and a purlin. And our design intent was to transfer the weight of the space frame to the folks in an elegant and an uh, aesthetic yet structurally sound manner. So the complexity of the piece was dealt with a key set of principles to have something that is visual, that's visually continuous. So we collaborated and married a few techniques. So the four core solid um, spread out limbs. So in that piece, you can see the solid pieces of the, the connecting part of the beam are all CLT pieces. CLT is um, cross lamination timber. Uh, I could give a basic overview of it. This is basically three layers of um, processed timber, but, and each alternate layer has the same, um, yeah, same direction of the uh, glue lamp timber, yeah. So, so the, the, core, uh, the four core solid spread out limbs were brought to life using cross lamination technique. This not only guided us to achieve the desired form, but also increase the cross grain distribution throughout the pieces, increasing the strength of the limb. So this for us, we had a lot of tapering end of the solid pieces. So the reason why we used cross lamination is because if we use a solid piece of wood, that really tapered end would be considered really weak. So using cross lamination timber helped to strengthen that um, part of the core limb. And then um, the continuous curves are achieved through combine, uh, the combined technique of coal bending with glue lamination of wood slats, which went hand in hand. Uh, and the limbs acted as the base jigs, as well as the core support for the bent lamp process. So the core piece you see here is also sort of like acting as a spine, but also acting as a jig for the continuous wooden slats that's gone through there. So yeah, I think this would be a better understanding of the piece. So these are the four core pieces. And this also acted as a jig. And while this acted as a connecting medium, 
all the wooden slats acted as a connecting medium, the core pieces acted as a jig. So it was sort of like supporting each other. And this is the process we went through while making. So this is where I think we were testing it out before we were, took it to main school. So, and our stimulus limb sort of acted as a structural pass uh, for the weight to pass down from the space frame to the forks. So a key fabrication method methodology was sort of worked from this process of understanding how the combination of CLT and glue lamination worked. Uh, and this sort of became the core principle fabrication method for our pod. So these are the 12 cells you can see of each pod. And um, so before we get into that, uh, my co uh, group mate, her thesis was about um, Lam, uh, coal bending and lamination and basically learning a lot about the wooden properties and we used the, her research for the project and which was very helpful for us as well. So this, these are the, this table was created by our senior cohort um, who did the Wakeford Hall and we can see the different type of trees that they've tested which is spruce, Douglas fir, beech and cedar and all of them for the same length we tested with ash, their bending properties, a bending angle and the bending point uh, for the uh, radius we required was five mm. That was, that was the maximum thickness that they could achieve for that. So when we tested out ash with the moisture content of 10.5 to 10.8, we were able to get the radius of 270 mm with 10 mm thickness. That means we could use lesser uh, material. So, I mean, uh, using ash was a great advantage for us there as well. So this is how we tested it out. So we, we started from a lighter material to a heavier material and see what was the maximum we can, how do I say, <coughs> maximum breakage point we could find out. That's how we tested it out. So the, the reason we tested it out is because we have a lot of tight angles and tight radiuses for the pod. So it was very important for us to know that the breakage, the chances of breakage is very less. So I'm just gonna, before I get into it, I'll just play a video of our fabrication process so you guys can see a quick walkthrough of making of one single cell. We took, we took, I think, uh, initially when we just started making it, we took one day to make half a cell, two days to make a whole cell. And as we progressed and with using more types of jigs, we were able to do this in a very more efficient manner, I could say. It's a very intense um, 1.52 months of um, production. And this is me just as, as soon as my um, group sort of graduated, this is working on it, working on the rest of it as much as I could. Yeah. So this is this is what uh, how we started off with. So when we started off making each cell, we start we did it with our hand, we using handheld jigs, um, sing, singular pieces of jigs. And later on, we realized that was a very time-consuming process. And um, with the help of Dimitri, we were able to create. He was able to he designed a jig for us, and this sort of really helped us. Um, 
fast forward, I mean, the time that required for us to make each cell. And with this jig, our production um, time really accelerated from, we were able to make around two cells a day while we were only able to make half cell a day. Um, this is the, this is how the jig looks like. So after we made the cells uh, in the jig, we took it to the CNC and then we cut it out in different, you can see here in each angle that we, we were required to. We, what we needed. So each cell, depending on the size, was either divided into two made pieces or four major pieces. And each piece was divided into another two pieces because our CNC bed could not, you know, fully handle the height of the required thing. So we had to do it half, 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 sort of like this. So if this, that's one of the biggest cells over there, the top skylight window, this was divided into four pieces. These four pieces were again divided into half. So eight pieces combined in the first image, then the four pieces combined here, and then the final piece was made. So this was a whole day process to make one cell. Yeah, this is us making the big cell. And after that, we started off with, I think you guys can see here, the uh, cold bent ash pieces over here. So what we did was instead of um, directly giving the pressure and using straight fresh pieces, what we did was we pre-bent them overnight. So once each cell were made, we pre-bent all these ash pieces overnight and kept. And the next day we used um, this pneumatic jig over here, this um, pneumatic gun, we call it. Um, this We made it with the help of Charlie. And with this, with this, this switch right over here, this moves accordingly and sort of pushes it. So we can control the speed of this according to the radius of, so if it's a tighter radius, it's lower we did. If it is a larger radius, it was easier, a little bit more faster. And if it was like really easy radius, it's like that, we sort of did it by hand. And we clamped them again for around like three to four hours. So this is how we did this is, we cold bent, them, sorry, we pre-bent these pieces overnight, then use this jig, and this is like a whole cell you can see at the most bottom below. This is how we... Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'll just yeah. quickly, yeah. Yeah, so this is how we did it. And each cell had a different angle. So since we wanted to connect cell to cell, um, as much as possible using wood itself. So we had each, each cell had different angles that we had to cut and these were connected. I think you guys can see here on the point, we're connected like that. I could talk about the evolution of joints very quickly. Um, so we started off with uh, joints using, we started off with just making joints and then try making limbs. But then we realized that was like a different approach that we needed to take. So we started making cell by cell and then make creating the joints like that. Um, so this is how each cell are divided into different pieces, different uh, uh, glue lamp pieces. And then before then, before we put it into CNC, sorry, I'm just rushing over, so I'm just forgetting what to say. So this is an exploded view of the cell. And before we put it together, we had to actually lay it all on the floor in this manner so we can actually mark where to join it and where the domino connection is supposed to be. And this is how we did it right over here. We marked it and then we sort of built it together and with using ratchet straps, uh, the first half we built it by hand. It was, it's not that heavy to hold this half. Three people could just lift it pretty easily. And um, then using telehandler, we sort of fixed the rest like we saw in the video. Uh, this, is, this is like the timber log structure and the domino connection. I think you guys can see it. So this is how we connected all the pieces through there. And yeah, this is, so if we did have more time, I think we could have explored a little bit more. So the joints, if you, if you go inside, you can see if we can connect the joints a bit more, a little bit more aligned and it would have been perfect. We do have small gaps that's been shown here. And this was just like right before leveling the legs. And this, this cut piece, we cut one of one, 
at the bottom of the legs. And this is, you can see the cross lamination pattern created through CLT and GLT combination. And this is just a process. So this is the initial floor uh, design we had, but with the time frame that was given, we couldn't bring the cell again to the floor. It could have been a bit more complicated. And this is how we hope the pod would look like on the site to be able to go like, to be able to face and to be able to rotate um, and for the night sky. So depending on the user, they could use it however they would prefer it. And this is how we formed the flow design. This is the right, this is how it is right now because doing it alone was a bit hard in general. So the temporary skin right now is uh, what we have right now over there, which I hope to do before I leave is um, a shrink wrap um, before another cohort could come in and take. And this is a skin I hope that they could use the typology of skin to maintain the shape of the pod. And yeah, this is this is how I hope the pod is used on site. Sorry, I had to rush through this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you guys have the time, please. Um, if you guys have the time, please just see the joints. See all the Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Hi, Mr. Yuling, and uh, I'm. Uh, I work with uh, your man, the other three graduated um, science students, to finish uh, the first station I saw on site. And my personal part will consist of four parts. The first two, braces and decking, is related to the group work, and the, the next two is about landscape and the, my personal research. First is the, the site location. We just went there, and I want to put emphasis on the uh, uh, landscape. Maybe we can see here. Yes, there's two hills far away, and what what we saw the sometimes the shapes and the cross are there. Uh, yeah. And next, I'm maybe I'm uh, come. Uh, I'm going to answer some questions you asked just now. Like we have, this is a false analyte from Arab. So we can see it's almost around the, the main columns of fox where we need more strong braces to hold. So we have, I, I, I need to say four types, uh, three types, but for different uh, braces, which are colored in red, yellow, blue, and gray. The gray one is the parameter which we will reuse from the project review. And the red one we, are, we saw it's the biggest one. It's almost they are 12, uh, 12 in total and connect to the steel. Uh, and the yellow one and the blue one, they are all the same joints, but different diameters. So I should say, answer the question, they have three different types. And they have, uh, uh, according to the, uh, the forces, we marked the diameter of each versus. So when we put it here, we can just say these chats within the color, is that from 50 to 70, or over 70 or over 80. Then we just put the braces here. It's like that. And about the one piece, or is that the braces st straight or not? Because in most cases, it's the thinner the braces they are, they are more wonky. But when they get bigger, and sometimes we cut over 90, or sometimes we get some 
biggest one over 10, uh, 10 centimeters. It's so quite straight. But the thing is, when we use that, the robot can hardly cut it through. That's a problem. So we, we need to balance all, all the stuff. So these are the, the scans and photos of four different stuff, four different, uh, three different types and different lengths and diameters shown here. And the, the script I wrote with white. And then it's the same shot, like just showed in the demonstration. We need, although the, the robot can help us a lot, but we still need some to take care of, the, do some hand saw to, to just adjust that. And so this is the process type two, which is the biggest one just uh, on, at the top of the columns, near the columns with the steels. So we, I made some jig once I can put it in, which means it's fit in all the cross this horizontally, and then cut the uh, cut it into lengths and draw the hole, find the central line, draw the hole to the steel connection. This is the Bruce is type two. The third one is they are the parameter because they are shorter and they have different joints at the at both ends, uh, different from the they used in product reviews. So I made another jig, which I could change the 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 the, uh, the degree of that joint. Yes, and then we're going coming to the decking part. This is the scan from Thomas uh, before uh, on August before we do anything. To, 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 oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, uh, <laughs> that's uh, the scan on December, which we already finished uh, the field station. And this is a different species and different wood we use within this build station. The beech and ash fox and all the crops that are ash wood, all the uh, braces that beech. And to, uh, for the decking, we use Norway spruce and Douglas fir for the columns. And this is the plan of the decking. Uh, yes. You can see here. Because we just saw the deck, deck in, so I just quickly go through it. And there's some uh, working process of it. it just because I, at first I think it's very easy to just finish that, but the thing is we, we saw we need assignment back and forth, sometimes it takes longer time. If I just need something, like I forgot the screw, a hand saw, I need to cut it again, like some very tricky angle like this, I just need to come back and forth like this. And this, I think, the end. And then it's going to come into the individual part about the plants. And this is uh, near my hometown, an island uh, called Hu Wan. It's near Shanghai. And this is a village, uh, like, near the ocean, near the sea, but people doesn't stop living there. And within 10 years, all the, how say, wide plants just coming and growing back on everything they can get. And this is what I saw before I come here. Then I came here and saw this deer hide. And it's a deer hide. Uh, I found the photos in the archive which is from the 20, uh, 2015, the year it is built, and then the 2019 and the year I came here. Like wasting seven years, so we can say, also oh, it is proper, how to say, proper dealt with the groundwork, but the, the nature just still taking the structure back. And when we step on, it's like, it's not so stable as it was before. So I'm just, just start thinking about can we just because they are all without good maintenance they are just structure wide in the forest can we just uh, um, take it into consideration when we build this field station then my ideas come out with uh, 
the, the tre trellis, trellis. Trellis, sorry. the trellis and the plants, the climb the climbers. And start with the wheels, a screen, something like that, and make the, the great studies. Like it's just the original or initial ideas coming at the same time with a space frame. But I start using the square wood, but not the round wood, but they are uh, coming like they are happening at the same time, the round wood thing and the square wood thing. So uh, I did. And also another question to answer because we, 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 we really were trying to find the solution. Is that possible to not only to uh, put this structure as a horizontal one as a roof, but is that possible to make it vertical or leaning as a wall, something like that? But the thing is when it's going this way, vertical or leaning, the, the forces they change. And like before we have something like this and I, I sorry, the, the force is changed, so it's not stable as it was, and we add more like stuff this way, or yeah, it's just an uh, explosion. And this is a college of the monad drawing, like the impress, the impressest. And why I choose, they are all the college of one painter. Why I chose Monite is because the impresses they are always talking about, especially Monite. He's talking about why he draws it so fast and just draw it like this because the, the landscape, the thing, it changes so quick that he cannot have enough time to draw it very delicately. And like what we feel, it's, it's not so evident today, but like one day I, I want to walk outside and it was raining when I was in North Star Stain. And I saw there's some sunlight going through in my room from the window. I said, oh, I need to go now. And then I just go down the hill. It has some that hills. It's not raining, it's hills just dropping on my head. <laughs> then I just uh, put everything down, down the ground and I take it here and taking every stuff with me. I keep going just up hills, it stopped. And it's going to uh, sunny again. And when I arrived outside, it's raining and windy. Like just things up to 10 minutes. The weather just changed a lot. And this is exactly the same thing. I feel the, like the weather in the forest. It's changeable. And like the landscape it is. And also here, I'm wondering because what we can see is we, we are at the, the uh, sorry, was a crossroads of the forest. And we can always say the people who are walking, uh, walking around and with, with the dogs and sometimes with the horses. And we, we can stay here saying, uh, watching the, the cross, the, the sheep far away on the hills. Up, up the hills and seeing the people passing by. And also like the, the, the lady here is yeah, something we are talking or joking at. Oh yeah, okay, sorry. Like uh, maybe we can do, because we always do some um, life drawing class. Maybe we can do one or sometimes in the, in the white forest. And this is uh, what I did. We just saw it, the photos of it. And the model is the, the structure, the more detailed stuff. Like it's connected into the cube and then with the, uh, with the glue and another fishing line taking everything to the another structure and upgrade. One aspect is for the structure and another is adding the fishing line can help the plants to find something up right to grow. And this is, yes, like what you told me, the exact thing. This is what I saw uh, when I went to Venice, the Nile. I saw in the garden, like that structure. I, I, I at first I only see that it was, uh, I think it's, it was a tree, but it's not. When I uh, looking upwards, I saw the still inside. 
So I'm thinking about like, uh, is that possible? I make this structure and let the plants grow. And in five, uh, five years, 10 years, when the structure is not so stable, but the plants, they are strong enough and big enough, just hold it and hold all the structure itself. And I start to do something in front of my dormitory in Westminster. This is, I choose one of the, the process, I choose the plants and the, the process they are going. I choose two different, but they are all the calamities, but two different variations with like the, the growing speed, the flowering time, like that. And this is what I saw here. I just want to share because every morning when the sun comes up, I can see on, the, on my curtain, this uh, the leaves, they are slowly moving with the wind. And this is the angle from my room to outside. We can, I can see just the, the, the plants going there. And sometimes I will have some visitors. I think maybe because of the, the plants, like the birds, at first I can only see the, <laughs> the poo <laughs> on the leaves. Then I find their nest because they were living. And the bees in the flowers and sometimes the spiders, everything. And I also find some steer just having the eating or staying in front of my window. So they are, I think they are only happening here or in forest. I have the chance to see everything like that. It's kind of emotional, but it's what the plants and that, that thing brings me this good emotion or good memory. And also I, uh, in the process, I saw some, some, some place, they have cemetery we use in the fuel station. And asked that they only use like within five years, but it's broke a little bit. They are almost the same structure. I think maybe in five years, we will have some little breaks in the roof as well. Well, can a loss, yeah, can a loss my plants to grow through maybe. Not only in wasting the, the process, but only go through the roof. And this is the process I ch uh, choose uh, white climbers, different from what I chose before in front of my dormitory. This time it's, it, this species must be proper. It, it, has, it should have the, how to say, the, the strength to, to live in the forest itself. So I start with uh, advice from Chris, and also I look through the books of the white uh, climbers in the forest. And I search all the like conditions, all the spots, and I do the, the grasshoppers. And then I choose the honeysuckle, but they have different uh, variations, but this one is uh, the UK native one. Yes. And it, so the thing is, it do not need a lot of sun, sun uh, light, but also, uh, but the, the side it has a lot. And the bloom, the bloom period is good from June to September. And we can have the, uh, has it as a medicine and what I did as a herbal tea. And it's native to the UK. It, and it is also like, it can attract bees, birds and moose. It's good for the forest itself. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The last part. Sorry. The last part is about the the, the time lapse camera. It was there was two. One is on the tree and another one here. And we will see a video from August to December. Uh, edited by G. <laughs> This is from the morning. Uh, and the working process. Is, the time is here, but I don't know how to hide it. Sorry. This is not my computer. Because we can see the time and the temperature in this line. And just, we can almost say the, the trees are falling leaves from August to December. But for the longer period of time, you can see more uh, landscape change and I think these two cameras at first I, we set it up we set them up just for the for uh, filming the construction period time but now we, we can have uh, we can make a, a 
better uh, decision where it can be put for the next 10 years or five, five years or 10 years. And in this area, we can already say within, within three years, this is uh, the, uh, a little bridge which is made by Arab uh, three years ago, but it's, it's, uh, they, they just take it off because it's not so safe to put it outside because it's going very, very high. So it already has some change in this area and we can see this, this part is a Citco spruce, which will be seen in 10 years and they're still growing up and they will probably blocking the, the view to the upper hills later as well. And for now I choose, I have five potential spot for the upcoming camera, time-lapse camera which is the first one. I have the pros and cons, second, third, first, fifth, and they are all together. Yes, we can just do the precision of choosing the site. And then the last colleague for the award. Yeah, okay. yeah. We had a full parable, maybe I should spend time trying to make most of the buildings down the street. And these three bits are really defining um, these three students' work beyond that on the speculations of the building. Yeah. Um, so I'll keep it short. Uh, so yeah, kind of having more or less done most of the structure by the end of September. Uh, there was also a bit of time to kind of speculate um, and analyze a little bit of what had been done throughout the year. Um, so I've been speaking with uh, Chris, so the head forester, who's actually not with us today. Yeah, he's in London. Um, but you're kind of looking at uh, more or less the, the direct surroundings of the field station and kind of building off of what yulin has been presenting, uh, just quickly going through uh, some of these these areas, um, looking at the 2024-2034 woodland plan that's coming up, uh, which kind of aligns quite well with these decade projections of, of the field station and surroundings. So for example, uh, quite quickly, uh, in the direct uh, subcompartment where the field station is, mainly being beach and alder, uh, and that'll be going through a thinning process, for example, along with this uh, row of spruce. Um, but for example, in this uh, top area, uh, mainly being ash, uh, since it's currently um, has this uh, fungal disease, it'll surely be dead within the next five years, but it'll be left uh, within the, the forest as deadwood habitat uh, to promote uh, fauna and flora within, within this area. And then if we look a bit more towards just the components of the space frame, or the field station, uh, for example, looking at the engineered cords, knowing that we've coated them uh, with one layer of uh, Danish oil, uh, we're projecting that it would last uh, along uh, seven to 10 years, uh, or for example, being able to do some monitor uh, treatments of uh, the tree forks, which are currently debarked, but not have, have been coated with a boron, uh, but um, would probably be a need another extra coating after a certain period of time and for example looking at uh, linseed oil Danish oil or also some um, boron cartridges and kind of see the reactions of each of these pairs of tree forks through time and seeing if some are reacting better than others uh, so the planks also for example are uh, so these spruce planks that haven't been uh, treated in any way so probably within the next couple of years will need to be um, treating it for the non-sipping, for example. Um, but I think more importantly for the situation that I've been looking at in this past couple of months is uh, the roundwood brace. So we haven't treated it in any way that knowing that it's kept its, uh, its bark. Um, so it's, it's highly likely for it to fail more quickly than the rest of the structural components of the space frame. Um, kind of uh, assimilating like around five to seven years of a lifespan. Uh, and so this is kind of this larger conversation that I'm trying to have with eventually the next generations of, of Hook Park or students of Hook Park 
uh, with the Beaver's Mantra, which is um, extending a building's lifetime through perpetual maintenance and intensive care. And looking at this specific scenario of the roundwood uh, brace, and knowing that uh, within the assembly process, uh, you had to place the roundwood brace simultaneously with the cords. As you can see here, you can't really remove uh, the brace at all. Um, and that means that if there were to be a moment where uh, this roundwood brace would be damaged or broken or rotten, um, how could you actually replace it uh, knowing that the full space frame is already assembled? Uh, this is what uh, the, the prosthetic tries to do. Uh, but also within this whole context of uh, researching and analyzing each of these roundwood braces, there was a quite uh, scarce amount of these available braces left. So for example, this one being um, one of the braces that we actually robotically cut, but uh, was considered defective because it had a slight, um, slight split along its torso. Um, so this was the thing, it was kind of working with um, the existing components with the existing roundwood braces that were either cut or some of these um, that were cut after with the, the robot and just trying to analyze through hybrid, hybrid drawings uh, and being able to kind of simulate what kind of uh, strategies, were, strategies were possible to be able to replace this roundwood brace. Um, so essentially it's this, uh, this rigging screw, which as you can see here, um, the rigging screw, which uh, as long as you can as, replacing your roundwood brace and being able to include it within uh, the final space frame, knowing that you can deploy uh, the rigging screw uh, from within so that the, um, the roundwood brace would be working under uh, compression as um, initially. So part of the, the main conversation is to uh, make sure that this is accessible for the next generation of the book. Uh, this is why uh, you can see here the pedestal being this this kind of guide um, to have the next generation to be able to not only have the sample of the prosthetic directly visually to understand, but uh, some components already pre-cut uh, for someone to be able to directly fabricate through the guide that's been uh, transferred onto the wood as you can see here. Um, and again, having this as somewhat of a prototype to be able to test uh, the deploying mechanism before um, doing an operation within the space frame. So this is what you saw a while ago within the space frame. There was one of the prosthetics that were uh, deployed um, early December just to sort of confirm that the whole thing would work. It worked, <laughs> it was nice. Um, and I think, yeah, it's mainly for me, it was it's been an amazing year. Um, but I think through this example, it's trying to demonstrate to uh, the next generations to really engage much more with the existing buildings, knowing that there is a really strong legacy within within Hope Park, within all the buildings that are existing. And just kind of through understanding or looking at what the buildings actually need the types of maintenance or mending, as Kate was mentioning, um, then it kind of also pushes you to engage then with the outside, with the existing surroundings, um, which is also something that I think coming into Hook, uh, you know, there was this intention of really spending a lot of time in the workshop. Um, but I think for over the past few months, it's even over that, um, being able to spend time on site was something that was really, uh, really special. Um, and I think all of the buildings here at Hook deserve to have a prolonged life. So this is how, yeah, how it starts to trigger and activate that. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, thank you for that. It's a very nice conversation. Um, um, and I really like the just of Encourage of pieces. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect it doesn't actually work, you know, it's, you know, it's a compressed, it's a compressive piece. Yeah. And you've got these steel pieces going into it, yeah. in, in, into wood mm -hmm. in a way that, mm -hmm. that they, they're just awesome. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Activating any strategy, but yeah. finding yeah. essentially. Yeah. And, and, and you don't need to put prefabricated pieces and so mm -hmm. on. And this, is, this has been the, one of the problems with so many um, supposedly flexible structures. Is that in that, that um, because because all the pieces have to be manufactured in a bespoke way, yeah. but in the end you, you can't get the bits or you can't pair the bits mm -hmm. or, or, mm -hmm. or whatever. And, um, maybe, maybe maybe the sort of tech, you know, the technology of a piece so you're trying you're trying to do it with the, the, the main the main yeah. structure with with um, admirably simple technology in, yeah. in the end. You know, yeah, doing, doing a lot of work. With, yeah. With very with very few operations, and, um, so maybe, maybe this you know it's really, it's a really nice idea, but it, it may it maybe needs more of the spirit of the yeah yeah the yeah. I, I think it was also a little bit capricious. It was something where I was trying to <laughs> add a little bit of the, the metal into this, this whole thing, just as a mechanism. I, I, I can I can answer but, that. but I think yeah, it, it's. Yeah, it's more like trying to start that that conversation in terms of um, maintenance, and also knowing that since there's actually a lot of redundancy within the space frame. So if you're just looking, especially at the space frame, then there's also this chance for people to actually have their own kind of version of it, which I think would be really amazing if you had ten different people kind of giving ten different of their own versions. Um, so I had a conversation with Maker, and he was already proposing one of those. Other versions, and I think if you again look at that, the idea of this this redundancy again, then there's a little bit of everyone's personality that kind of shows. Of course, one of the other things is that it needs to be structural, right? So of course that's why I put it on the side. <laughs> um, but I think yeah, that's that's one of the strategies, like for the for the studio, right? Where there's there they've been wrapping around with the. I think it's some sort of resin, right? To make sure that it would bind together. And that was uh, ah, right. <laughs> so the thing about a handover mm -hmm. the, the objects of hand and the objects rather than necessarily just the man. Yeah. Like the idea that this thing needs to be thought about in that way, what's the mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Also going to do the feelings for in terms of like Trying to open up to the future and think. Yeah. 
Halo. Malu. Ya.
just sort of a handover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have, yeah, we have two some labs camera and we have all the same card. For the, the new students, because they yeah. they will encounter these sort of structures. Do you leave uh, suggestions? So do you no, specifically for the trellis. For the trellis, because this is yes. going to require some care. Yeah. Yes, and um, also I heard that maybe you can. I know we already have some landscape background students now this year, and maybe there will be some landscape students in upcoming academic years. I think they know much better than me. <laughs> I don't know. You seem to have a very a beautiful reading of the landscape. I really enjoyed your observations and the narrative you set up around the three projects. I'm kind of <laughs> The, um, in in uh, typography, um, the serifs um, on the letters, the, the shapes and, and the curves on the serifs relate to the tools that will cut the wood blocks to make the print. And on, on, the, on this, the, the, the fillet, if you like, the radius of the fillet on here. So relate relates to the, the, the thickness of wood that you're using on this yeah. surface and the pen that yeah. you can make with it. This thing's a very nice, you know, it's a very nice sort of decision making, sort of self calculating, sort of decision making process. And then then the the sort of structurally it, it's um it's a series of almost triangles pretending not to be triangles so they, <laughs> they're, they're triangles like the front triangle of a bicycle frame yeah. if you like that also almost triangles so it, it, it's um where and where the where the fillets also also make the moment joints of the structure the the, the sort of strongest part so it, it, it's a sort of coherent it's a coherent constructional and structural structural idea yeah. and it's spatially it feels very different to, to the to it to its um um preceding the the, the the library yeah. frame and it's it's it's, it's, a, it's a much more singular sort of way of drawing yeah. space but even even so I, I suspect like like the frame in the library it's it's also asking for a bit of room to breathe. You, know, it, it, you need, you need to, we, we need to experience it how we experience here when we're on the inside. We, we need, we need to see the, the fullness of it rather than it just being wrapped. I suspect. Yeah. So I, I, I suspect it, it's, it's, um, I suspect it, 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 it's going to have a skin on the outside. That, I suspect that needs to be separated away from it a little bit, you know, to give it to give it that room. Yeah. Um, to have, 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 have the sort of the sort of presence of drawing space that it has yeah. has here. Yeah. Mm. I think the I think the the rounded fillets you're talking about, the, you know, the, the bent make it uh, really make a difference. I think they make it really organic. It's really organic shapes in mind with honeycomb or whatever it has a really kind of um it, it feels like you know it, it should sit in a, in a landscape you know without those hard triangles and being rounded and so i think it's really beautiful when you use that i'm not sure if it needs to go and hang out in this space for the, the free stage i feel like it has no me too i don't really have that much in common like they don't need each other, right? They could just go off on the on their own. Because this is sitting outside the field station. Part part of the other. Seems to be a field. For me, I hope there is this one eccentric student who really likes to roam around the forest in his or her own space, and the pod gets to travel each year around Hook Park. I think. That would be really nice. It doesn't have a permanent space and it gets to go around different places too. I, and Hoop's got a really beautiful landscape for that. And different types and different, um, how do I say, levels. So, yeah. 
So that would be really nice. This could go down by the cabinets. That's a really nice open I'm space. Wondering, actually, would you consider it as like the platform for the sun? Yes. You put the, the sun inside. Put the sun inside. Oh, really yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wait, wait, we can start that sound on and put the sound in the <laughs> I mean, we, we often spoke about the procession because it, it's kind of portable with, say, eight people. Right? You know, just, just, just a religious kind of thing of actually like, picking it up and moving it to a different location. Like those phone racing. Yeah. <laughs> Still was treated, but the, the idea of the future life and the, the, the whether or not it's fixed or the plants are growing on it, I guess. Pass me on this where does this go? The pedestal, yeah, Wait, this pedestal. thing, yeah, this thing is meant to stay in the workshop, yeah. So, so yeah. in the workshop, it will inevitably become part of someone else's project at some point. Well, yeah, it, that's and that's that's why, you know, I, and I think the idea was put it on the feet because that way it's at a place. Because there, there is a lack of storage still, right, inside the studio. So if it has, if it becomes its own storage, then it becomes more easy to transport. I guess where I was wondering was, is there a way it can live at the field section? Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, yeah. Because, you know, it struck me as, you know, you've got all that you had in, in the book, which I've lost. You also had, you had also this like timeline of when things need to happen, yeah. and it sort of struck me as like almost like you know when you walk into a bathroom that says I was last cleaned twenty minutes ago. It feels like your the field station is say I was last oiled two years ago. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, and and I, I just wondered like there's always these discussions about. I mean, it gets very abstract when you start talking about, oh, what well, future society will discover it and know that you need to pick up this tin of Osmo oil once every three years. But um, I guess yeah, I wonder true. how you do communicate to people yeah. that they should yeah. fix it. Yeah, 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 that's, that's, that's true. I think that's, that was the idea. Initially, knowing that that's where there's the most people, most, most frequently in, within the workshop, but it's also transportable. But I really think that the idea of having it over there and knowing that you can kind of add to this thing, you're saying like another set of instructions to say within the space frame, okay, it's been that uh, the nut tightening that happened a few months ago. So. I definitely think there's an element of keeping the tools needed to maintain something that are better kept yeah. with the with yeah. the objects, you know. Otherwise they they become lost or yeah. forgotten. Someone's like, what's this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh yeah. And the project. Your maybe maybe your thesis makes much more sense with with um with this sort of structure than the the, the, the free trial. <clears throat> but because I I suspect there's a huge amount of redundancy in this where you could where you could just take out a whole section mm -hmm. and the rest of the structure would still yeah. maintain it and so on. Right, right. right. But where, whereas with, with, with three trees, if you take one tree out, <laughs> and you're. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a bit delicate. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think one of one of one of the questions that, that what you have been describing asks is about the sort of larger research project of the place and how how it, how it builds. Um, and and maybe you know what maybe the more interesting priority of your question is 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 how does the, how does the knowledge that you've 
proof through these go on to yeah. to other people mm -hmm. and uh, just 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 looking just you know remembering all the models mm -hmm. seen over the years coming here and yeah the piece sort of whittled down in the other room but, but, but as, as as well as a library you probably need a museum um, to sort of start you, you have a lot of embodied knowledge in, in thing in things like this and and that, that probably probably requires a thing and probably a document to go with it mm -hmm. um and that's that that's probably the knowledge that you you're bringing forward is partly stuff that people learn from but partly um pillage and we use your thing in a way that you never hoped for or <laughs> imagined um, but, 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 yeah as I, as it's it's it seems like there's some danger of a whole lot of things. You know, at the bar, that every year, tons of amazing work just gets trashed. It's just, it's just, I mean, it's just obscene. Yeah. Um, that's a, you know, the amount of work that people have put care into, and it just, yeah. you know, there's nowhere to put it or something. But if you, if you, if you go to get, you go to a medical school. Get all these sort of fragments of, of dead bodies with all sorts of problems that you can learn from. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, the hunter. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That sort of thing. <laughs> but a uh, really, really enjoyable day. Um, yeah. Lots of, lots yeah. of amazing work. Great Thank work. You. Day. Really good fun. Thank you for having me. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Right. Thank you guys. Yeah. Last week's standard. <laughs> <laughs> um, amazing work, amazing effort. Like, I, I don't think it can be underestimated the amount of effort, like hard manual labor it took to do these things. So, uh, thank you for that. I think you all think of your time. Thank you to the cricket. Thanks for sticking it out the whole day and coming all the way down. Welcome everyone, welcome in the room. There is actually a room camera on here under Miguel, um, Miguel's laptop. So if you can find that, you might want to pin that when the when we start the Q and A, and you can kind of see everyone. Um, we're absolutely delighted to welcome Eleanor Lakelin to speak down at Hook Park and as part of the MArch jury for the keynote. Um, Eleanor is a sculptor, a uh, sculptor in wood. Um, she only works with wood grown in Britain. Um, it seemed fitting to have her here to talk to us and we're talking about um, the projects built from uh, the wood from our own forest down here this afternoon. Hopefully you'll join us at 2.30. Um, and only, only trees felled due to decay, I understand. Um, so she has a, a deep knowledge and a passionate interest in the natural properties of timber. Um, her works exhibited internationally um, and is part of prestigious private and public collections. Um, the v &A, um, Museum of Arts and Design, New York, Museum of London, um, Norway, um, many more. Um, we're absolutely thrilled to have twisted her arm to make it all the way down to Dorset. And um, I'm not gonna jabber on any longer. I'll hand over to Eleanor. Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I've been meaning to come down for many years and um, I'm glad I finally made it. And um, um, I look forward to seeing more projects that you've been up to this afternoon. Um, we may have different motivations in um, sculpture or architecture, but I think we've got many common concerns. We're interested in um, 3D form and space and light and material. Um, and uh, we may walk through a building and around an object or sculpture, but certainly here and, and in my own studio, we, we both develop new um, experimental ways of working with material and try and investigate the complex properties of wood and find out ways of um, using them. 
And having experimented myself with different materials, um, clay and plaster and bronze in the last couple of years, what I what I discovered was that that um, hearing about or using um, other materials or, or finding out about other disciplines actually taught me, it gave me a, a much better and a new understanding of my own. So I hope that um, as I take you through my ideas and processes and um, the way my own journey with wood has gone, I hope that it gives you some sense of yeah, my, my relationship with, with wood and my motivation, but I also, at the same time, I hope it provokes some, some thoughts about your own. So this is, um, this is Inislas in, um, in West Wales. Um, it's the petrified forest. Um, and I was brought up in a tiny rural community on a sheep farm in, in um, Wales, uh, 17 miles to, to my school. Um, on a farm, a very isolated community. And this was the nearest place you could go to the uh, beach. And sometime during the uh, mid late sixties, I went there as a child and was kind of uh, amazed by this, uh, this place where I usually went to swim. There, there was this kind of army of statues um, on the beach, this petrified forest, these ancient um, trees that were standing up. And it was my first sculptural experience, I think. And it also, uh, I think I went home that day with a small piece of it, um, hopefully from on the floor, but uh, and put it in my pocket. And and that was um, that was really important to me as a child. I collected um, I collected lots of things, and, and and I walked around with stuff in my pocket. I always had uh, pebbles and shells and bits of old wood and bleached out bone. And there was. Um, and I wouldn't have thought about it in these terms then, but there was something about the rhythm of growth and decay, that whole cycle of growth and decay and that um, building up and breaking down of material by the natural elements um, that I found fascinating. The idea that if you, if you held a piece of uh, this wood or any other, uh, or a shell, you could feel that time in your hands um and so you could feel the narrative and the history of of that piece of material through human touch and so i think even at a really young age i i kind of understood the power of materials that if i wandered around with all this stuff in my pockets if i if i held on to something i could be transported to a different time and a different place um even an imaginative place to a different memory um and I think growing up in a, a very rural place, it, it brings you very close to your environment. You have a kind of bone deep understanding of plants and animals. Um, and trees are, are a very important place in a rural community, as I'm sure you know. As children, we navigated our world through trees. We would arrange to meet each other at the Criggin Oak or by the nut tree or by... Whereas now in, in London, you know, I would navigate through pubs or, or, or tube stations. We navigated through trees. And um, I think they're the basic element in our natural world. They certainly are for me. And, um, you know, we see them as protection, as, as shelter, um, as survival. Or we have done, obviously, in the past in terms of fire. And they're symbolic in many cultures. You know, um, there's often a central meeting place in, in, in cultures. I've lived in where that's the, that's the meeting place for the community. It's where decisions are made. Um, and so I feel it's the most democratic of material. Uh, I'm sure you have your own relationship with it. But for me, it, it's everybody I who comes and see my work, they, they all have a story about wood. We, 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 it's in our kind of DNA. And, um, and there's something about wood, I think, that is a deeply sensual material. It, attracts all of your senses at the same time it you can you you see it but you can touch it you can you can smell it if you come you know into my workshop and uh the cedar you can you can it's so strong you can almost taste it and as i'm as i'm sure you'll know and i love the feel of it and how it makes you feel and i think it can invoke meanings and um it can be imbued with with narrative and with emotions and oh, I change over. Oh, I know. Um, I also, actually, I think um, what's interesting is that when we fell it, it can still be reborn. 
um, and transformed into an object or a sculpture or a building that still holds this kind of energy in its structure. And so I'm just going to run through a few other. My connected interest in geology is the same kind of wearing away of material. This is sandstone in Arizona. It's called the wave. Or uh, this is an old 50s uh, shots of the landscape from the air. I just find fascinating. In the 50s, there was a photographer called William Garnett who did the most amazing photographs of landscape from the air where they look like kind of abstract paintings. But it, again, it's all to do with that idea of material being worked on and worn away. And these are the cast. I spend a lot of time here in the longer dock in France. And these, these cave-like, uh, it's called a cast landscape. It's where that's been uh, eroded out through the elements, through water and wind. And uh, my last kind of interest well, uh, is uh, archaeology, I suppose, and uh, ruins and uh, that kind of thing. Um, now, I have no idea how all of the interest in your life and all your experiences and all your the way where you were brought up, or all of that kind of comes together to um, uh, comes out in your work. But um, Barbara Hepworth once said that um, what you want to say is formed in your childhood and you spend the rest of your life trying to find a way of saying it. Mm. And, um, and so I think that's true for me because it took me until, um, yeah, so you should be encouraged because it took me until I was 50 before I um, found a way to say it. And um, in 2011, um, I moved into uh, cockpit studios in in Deptford. I had I had already kind of found my way back to wood, having been a teacher and worked around the world. I I found my way back to wood in 1995 when I be I retrained as a cabinet maker, and I worked for um, quite a few years making furniture. And then um, in 2011, um, I moved to uh, cockpit because I had bought myself a lathe. In well, actually, I'd been on a five day wood turning, bowl turning course in 2008. And then in 2009, I built myself a shed in my garden and bought myself a secondhand lathe, but I had completely forgotten my five days. So for a couple of years after work as a furniture maker, I used to spend a couple of hours in my shed at night with a book, trying to teach myself how to turn on the lathe. Um, and I began, like everybody, turning uh, fairly functional uh, pieces. Um, uh, to hone my technique, you know, which I sold in, you know, heels and you know, functional items. And then I discovered uh, horse chestnut burr. And it was a, a complete revelation to me, um, a burr. Um, and even though this form is a simple bowl, um, it, it was like finding a new language with this material, because I had always felt drawn um, to fragments, you know, to not having the whole story. I was perfectly happy with a little bit of something. Um, and I've always found value and beauty in imperfection and in the irregular. I'm sort of, I'm fairly uninterested in perfection. And it's the kind of ways in which it is not that I think is interesting. Um, and so finding Burr, this kind of uh, reaction to discomfort or stress in a, in a wood um, that can be either a, an insect growing under the bark or somebody's banged a nail in the tree um, and it's grown over or somebody's cut off a limb and it's grown over. And this kind of dynamism of nature where cells are bubbling over each other in circles and um, it's like a sort of uh, dynamic means of survival, I suppose. And I just find the whole thing um, this really strange, mysterious landscape, really compelling. So there was no going back really after I discovered horse chestnut burr. And, and to this day, it remains my primary source material. Um, the forms I, I started to make developed, of course, and they became, um, I started to turn through a much smaller hole and they became much more sculptural, I suppose, and much more concerned with voids and light and shadow and how that played in a piece. Um, and I started using, um, sometimes there were no voids, but the space, the, in, the opening was smaller. So the interior space was kind of hidden and mysterious. Um, and uh, I started to bleach the wood. Uh, horse chestnut burr is very pale, but still um, 
by bleaching it, it somehow um, softened it. It made uh, it made me think of um, age, of that whole kind of softening of age and that whole thing of bones. And um, uh, so it had a lot of resonance resonances for me. Um, and it seemed to sort of accentuate that sort of strange ethereal kind of landscape. And in fact, I, I could imagine myself being a kind of very tiny person on top of that sort of landscape and moving around in that space. And so <clears throat> it also, it, it was a bit like archeology, span I suppose, um, this idea that um, you're unearthing layers, you know, you're taking off um, the skin, um, or the bark to kind of investigate the anatomy of the tree. Um, and so uh, you're trying to reveal something of its soul, I suppose. And also um, at the same time, I started to kind of be a little less concerned with um, uh, a bowl form or, or the interior space and actually following, I don't know whether you know, well, I'm sure you do, but in a burr, um, you know, or, all kind of uh, normal grain directions and everything is off. Everything is a kind of swirl. There's there's bark winding through the middle of them. And so I started sort of chasing out that bark through the natural formations of the bark, a bit like the cast kind of landscapes, the kind of cave-like landscapes. And I found that very interesting. <clears throat> now, burr is not, is not, you can't buy it on the show. Well, you can in very tiny pieces, but you can't in the kind of scale of the work I started to make. So at the same time, I started another series of work called um, Time and Texture. And this is because I had been, um, I'd been experimenting with the properties of wood where um, the, the tree doesn't grow at the same rate during the year, where it, it grows at a different density and a different speed through the year. So for example, ash or oak or cedar, they grow really quickly in the summer and the wood is quite soft and they grow much slower in the winter and that wood is much denser. So if you sandblast, you can blast away the softer wood and you can leave all the winters kind of standing up. And sequoia grown in Britain um, turns out to kind of do that with more variation in both of those um uh in both of those kind of facets so that became my my kind of second um second kind of uh uh material okay so this is mm, yeah uh this piece is called uh Ferris Rill. And this, this is kind of here really to, um, to demonstrate that whole idea of uh, what you can feel in your hands, the fact that you can feel time passing, that, that tactility, you know, our sense of touch is our first sense, way before we can talk, we can feel things. And so, so this work was all to do with that, with, with, with the fact that you could hold something, you could rub your hand, you could feel time passing. Um, and also it turned out that Sequoia had this other property that I could use, which was it's full of tannin. Now, uh, tannin plus metal plus moisture means it goes black. So obviously I discovered this because I, I turn my wood green when it's only been felled by six months or nine months. That's because then I can hollow out through a small hole. If it's, if it's, if it's hard and old, it's very difficult to hollow out. So, so when I was turning, I'm holding onto my gouge and the piece is spinning um, and it's green. And so I keep looking at thinking I'm black. Why am I black? The lathe's black, I'm black. And so obviously it's this, I discovered it's full of tannin. So now um, I play around with that property. I make my own iron solution. So if you boil wire wool or nails or whatever in distilled vinegar, white vinegar, you can play around with, you can, you can have the length of time you boil it for, or the, the amount of wire wool you put in, or the length of time you leave it after, all of those things can allow you to play with that property and have your, your piece go somewhere between um, black and a rusty kind of color. And depending on how wet you leave it, it can, it'll start to rust more. And so that also played into that, um, that metaphor of 
transformation of time passing, the idea of something moving from one perceived state to another, so that rusting process. Um, and this piece is just sandblasted, but this is what happens um, if you, first of all, carve it. So after I've turned the shape and I've hollowed it out to the same thickness all the way so it doesn't crack, then I will carve it. So obviously sculpting is a reductive material in what you're taking away. So I would take away the, the material so that I would leave, make circles, take away the material, round them over, sand it. So then I have a, a kind of an empty pebble shape with lumps all over it. And then after that, I would sandblast it so that you're looking at two, two layers of texture. So the first layer is the lumps, second layer is sandblasted in. And so, um, and that I like that sense of movement across the piece. So there's the movement in terms of the, you know, the rusting idea of transforming, but also there's movement in terms of, it gives me a sense of landscape. Um, and so, oh, well, it's the same piece. Uh, this piece was made last year and is, um, is called, um, I mean, I started to use the idea of, of landscape. Um, um, and this piece is called Landscape of Memory. And um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a valley in Wales that um, I visited for 40 years now called the Maldaf Valley. And um, the house I stay in there is called Druvelen, which means yellow hillside. And it's a, it's a valley, a volcanic valley, very near to Cadaridris. I don't know if you know that's very mountain up in uh, Wales. And it's very near the tree line. And the whole of the valley is kind of either bracken or, or kind of a yellow grass, hence yellow hillside. And there's a, there's a moment when the sun is setting, when this, this kind of gentle yellow light that sweeps around the valley. And so I wanted to make a piece that sort of uh, reminded me of how I, not just of that, what you can visually see, but how that made me feel. And so, um, so this piece was deliberately turned end grain into the end of sequoia so that I could catch the edge of it in the sap because the heartwood obviously has much more tannin than the sap. So then by putting iron solution on it, I was always going to have this kind of yellow flash where it had dipped into the sap wood. So those are the kind of um, decisions I make in terms of um, you know, using the properties. I have one more in this series. Um, that's this was called um, uh, Erosion Sequence 1, 2, and 3. Um, it's not actually in that order. I don't, I don't know why we photographed it this way, but one is in the middle and two is on the left, three is on the right. And, and there's an awful lot of artistic license, obviously, because it wouldn't actually quite road in this way. But the idea was, you know, can you imagine how something might start off with lumps and then be eroded away till it was... So it is just three different sorts of carving um, to demonstrate that kind of movement, that process of transformation. Uh, obviously made by turning, hollowing through the tiny hole. And in the case of the, the piece on the right, really, really thin. Um, and then carving through to leave holes and then sandblasting um, yeah. and using iron solution. Okay, so Echoes of Amphora. Um, this, this series is, um, oh, this series is, I've, I've, I've included this because this just shows you how other people can talk about your work in a much better way than you can. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, so yeah, that's the kind of thing I should be saying, okay, but anyway, uh, this series is based on obviously amphora, but not, well, you'll see, there's an echo. Um, okay, so I started this series about um, four years ago now, and it, it, it's the work I'm most known for um, now. Um, and it's because I was making the work in Burr, I was making with a kind of an organic form. All my forms were sort of, a, they were obviously based on a, a kind of seeds or pollen or um, um, this kind of circular uh, kind of a shape. Very, well, obviously I'm using a lathe, you know, that's a circular thing. Um, but then I decided, so we have an organic shape and an organic kind of phenomenon. And so I decided that by, by um, making a kind of classical vessel form um, 
which we all sort of understand, it would actually intensify this kind of natural phenomenon by it, it just being completely unexpected and not what you, it was never going to be. Um, there's always going to be this disruption and fragmentation of the line. And, and I also think I'm interested in how, uh, how we're connected to the past and how um, the past informs what we create now and how we can use um, fragments of the past uh, to create new work. Um, and so um, vessels, uh, vessels, I, I, I think vessels, they're one of cult, uh, they're one of um, uh, humanity's old, oldest kind of cultural markers really, aren't they? They're, 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 they're sort of a very old cultural form that we all kind of understand. They were used for our survival in terms of food and water. And, uh, but they were also used in a kind of a ritualist way where, um, a ritual way where um, they were used to carry um, a soul or the idea of carrying uh, sustenance for a soul from one life to the next. Um, at, but because I think they're sort of familiar or domestic, we want to engage with them. We kind of understand them. We, we want to kind of find out more about it and, and pick them up. And so I have, uh, I've sort of, um, I've used them more and more, this idea of this um, playing around with uh, this fragmentation and classical vessels. And, I, and obviously I try and push it as far as I can so that the readability of it as a vessel gets kind of pushed as far um, as is possible. And so there's a lot of, um, I mean, there's a lot of contrast and, uh, polarities in my work and I'm sure as um, as architects a very familiar idea that you you you're using contrasts um, so for example the ancient and the contemporary or the rough and the smooth or light and shadow or ordinary and magical or uh, volume and void um, all of these ideas and um, it, at this point is when I changed the way I looked at um, space in terms of vessels because I had started with a very clear exterior space and an interior space and uh, a very thin a very thin wall to the vessel in between and then suddenly I realized that because of using bird that if I left my vessels with a, a three inch thickness then I then I gained this kind of much more expansive sculptural space and so I started leaving vessels really really thick which causes obviously all sorts of issues in terms of drying a three inch piece of green wood. But it has been, uh, I mean, it's worth it for me in terms of the compromises. Obviously I have to try and control the cracks so that they don't completely crack through the entire thing. So uh, that has to be done by putting pieces in a, in a paper bag, changing the paper bag every day for a couple of weeks and then trying to slow down the drying. Um, uh, okay. I think the most Im important meeting um, in this work is this whole idea of um, two dimensions of time. So there's the cultural dimension of time, like the millennia that we've been um, uh, using classical form or vessel, that, that sort of vessel form, that whole idea of poise and restraint and um, human desire for kind of perfection in terms of that form. And then there's this kind of infinite geological time frame where there's this mad kind of surging dynamism of growth. Um, and so in a piece, I, I'm just trying to collapse both those two time frames. And so we've got one singular thing, one singular universe, but it can talk across time and space um, and culture and material, obviously, because you would expect that to be made from ceramic or stone, not, not wood. Okay. So these, these are the first column vessels I made. Um, I went on a research residency in 2018 to, to visit a, a sculpture, I don't know whether you know, called Ursula von Riddingsfard in, um, in the States, makes monumental work in wood and also Mark Lindquist. And um, I had been interested in uh, thinking about scale and they both make work, um, they both make sculpture that is composite. It's made up of smaller pieces. Ursula von Riddingsfard takes uh, four by four sections of uh, cedar that will be used for um, building. 
and laminates it all together and makes uh, makes work that is two stories high. And uh, Mark Linquist works in a much more kind of Brancusi type way, really sort of putting elements together. But anyway, it sort of um, it allowed me to think about scale and how I was going to deal with scale. Um, now, I've always um, I've always loved the physicality of working with wood, as I'm sure um, many of you do, that that whole idea of physically working something, of taking a big lump of material and shaping it. And I've, I've always loved that, that feeling of, you know, I can put on, I'm gonna make work with whatever I can physically lift and put on the lathe. And, but this allowed me to sort of um, change the scale of the work. And I was also tired of, um, the work was kind of on plinths, you know, and I wanted to see it on the floor and I wanted to kind of see it face to face. And I wanted it to feel a bit more like a human vessel. Um, and so now I have all these kind of uh, personages around my, <laughs> around my studio. Um, and these are, they're all about the same size as me, really. That that's, tends to be the size. Um, and these are scorched black. And um, that's a definite choice. I mean, my, my color palette is fairly restricted. It's either, it tends to go from white to black to rust. That's kind of it um but black for me um in the way that white for me means you know spirituality and some kind of ethereal quietness and uh black feels a bit more melancholic and slightly eerie um but kind of strong and it feels protected maybe because that's what scorching used to be about protecting ships or you know what I mean burning it to get a layer of protection um and ah, and this, I, I think because I only work in two, two species of trees, largely, not completely, but largely, what it means is that, that I have to develop work within fairly strict parameters. And I find that, I find that good for me, that there are boundaries, because otherwise, you know, you could be forever just having another nice piece of wood and another nice piece of wood. And I feel like it makes me think, I have to use my imagination to see how is this going to develop. Um, so I don't think boundaries are always necessarily bad. They can actually make you more creative. So, um, well, as you've actually seen with being given some, you know, a root or a whatever, it, it makes you think. So this is obviously a development from the column vessels. I was researching how columns go together, you know, in uh, Roman times, how drums of marble. So, uh, so I naturally kind of came to uh, pillars. And I think the most interesting thing about this is that it really is, uh, you really can see that interface between culture and nature. Um, it's that idea of monumentality versus decay. And that idea that it makes you think of, uh, you know, architectural, uh, places like the, I don't know, the Temple of Delphi or wh whatever, places that were built to do with power and domination or uh, to do with the power of uh, God or whatever. And I find them just much more interesting when they're ruined. Uh, I just think that they're more contradictory, but they're more poignant. And they talk about lots of things like fragility over time and just the fragility of our, you know, humanity, whatever. I think they're just an interesting. And, and in this case, um, I wanted them to feel, I don't know whether you know the temples of Angkor Wat in Cambodia, but if ever you look those up, the temples are all riven with roots and trees that are grow in between the walls. And they're the most amazing kind of sculptural thing that has happened to, anyway, I wanted the, the, the pillars to give you the sense of, to feel like you, when you're in front of them, you're not sure. You you know you're on the point of some kind of transformation, but you're not sure which one. Are they growing or are they uh, kind of dissolving? Are they appearing or dissolving, growing or decaying? And the idea that they might be decaying is actually wrong because in fact, they're made of burr, which is actually a means of survival. So there's this kind of um, interesting, uh, I could leave there. All right. Uh, this is the last uh, piece I'm going to show you, certainly in this <clears throat> series. This is called the Homage Bowl. It was made during the pandemic. In the pandemic, I was preparing for a solo show. And um, so uh, the studios where I worked was about 65 people in lots of different studios doing lots of different, using lots of different materials. Mm -hmm. 
but there was about six of us left. The only people left were the people who used really large machines and they had no option to kind of pack it up and take it home. So, but it was a really strange time. And um, this piece is just to show, it was a really big piece. The diameter is about four foot, I think. Um, and it was, it, it, it looks a bit like, a bit, people keep saying, oh, it looks a bit like a font, but it was to do with that idea of how can you, you know, every night we were clapping for NHS staff and it, I just wanted to make something that was that was really kind of something to do with the human spirit, that it was really big, this really big kind of uh, space that was about that, the kind of amazing kind of uh, depths of the human spirit, I suppose. Um, OK, well, I've sort of touched on process as we've gone along. But this is my studio, obviously um, a place to experiment and a place to play uh, as well as everything else. Um, now this um, this picture keeps causing controversy because I'm not wearing P PPE. <laughs> so can I just say that it was a setup uh, and I didn't need to retake it with, because usually obviously I have got a mask and it's just, it was a, a still from a film somebody was making and they wanted me to take it off because um you couldn't see who it was uh anyway it i've still put it in because it does demonstrate how you hollow you know so so this piece is the first piece i showed you the kind of moon jar shape anyway uh so i turn um on a lathe um and then i hollow it out and my main uh if you're interested in tools my main my main lathes um those are my main machines in my workshop um, I have Vic Marks, which are Australian, and uh, uh, a union graduate. And then I have a massive band store. Uh, it's kind of a bit like yours, but not as nice. It's not a Wodkin. It's <laughs> um, and, um, and then I have a, a compressor and an, a tank and a sandblast cabinet. And those are my main machines. Um, and the rest of it is um, angle grinders and, you know, well, well in fact, it's angle grinders and then it's carving machines. And then it goes literally down to dental tools and jewelry tools and waxy tools and um, wig pins uh, to get all the bark out of um, the wood. Because uh, if you're going to bleach something, you cannot have one single tiny speck of bark left in. So if you imagine the homage bowl, that took um, literally months to get all of that bark out. Um, because if you do, there's so much pigment in bark that if you bleach it, it'll just run with a little orange line all the way down your white piece. Um, okay, and this just, basically uh, I'm putting a lump of material on the lathe and I'm daily working it and reduce, I mean, uh, it's a reductive process, obviously taking things away. And I'm guessing slightly unlike you, I, I start off with some ideas about what, what I'm going to make, but not really, I have to leave an enormous amount of room for chance. Um, because otherwise it feels to me like I'm just manufacturing. And anyway, it doesn't work with burr, certainly, because you never know what you've got. You have to leave the bark on because you can't hollow something with, well, well, you have to, but th there's the voids make life very difficult. Um, every void you hit, your chisel might catch in it and throw the piece across the workshop. Um, and so, uh, so I leave the bark on quite late. Um, and so it's a sort of a dialogue. You, you Every day you go to the workshop and you try and have this sort of dialogue with the material and hope that at some point you start to have some kind of emotional bond with it, that it sort of means something to you. And you hope that all of those hours of working it will kind of imbue that piece with some kind of narrative or some emotion that when somebody sees it, they feel that too. I mean, that is the point. Um, and so this anyway is just here to show you that as Roger, I don't know whether you've read Roger Dakin's Wildwood, but he says, um, he says a thing about as in any collaboration, trees have their own ideas, and they really do. And so here I was thinking, right, I'm going to make a nice voided vessel, I'm going to drill a hole down the middle, I'm going to open it out. And then I start to realize that there's actually a lovely, beautiful branch winding its way across the middle. Um, and so obviously I have to completely change what I'm going to do and leave that because that's the most beautiful thing. Um, so very quickly, these, the, the column vessels are made in three parts, as I said, they're composite. So they are three different parts of the tree though. They don't, I, I choose the best bits from wherever in the tree there's a burr. And then I, 
I turn them on the lathe and hollow them, and then I leave them to dry for several months. And then by the time I take them out of the drying cabinet or wherever I've got them, they're not flat anymore. So then I have to re-flatten them again. And then I, I join them together and then I have to sculpt them together so that they make sense, so that they look when they're a column vessel like they were meant to be together. That there's no disguise in they're made of composite parts, but when you look at it, I want you to feel like the whole thing makes sense together. It's uh, So it all is sculpted together initially with um, angle grinders and then gradually carving chisels or carving machines, or right, right down to little tiny Dremel diamond burrs, making sure all of the little bits of texture fit as it goes down the piece. And then after that, the piece is jointed and um, glued up, and then it's a piece. And this just gives you a few ideas of me and my studio. Um, obviously, up yeah, top center, I got such backache leaning over there, sanding that bowl that um, in the end, much easier getting in it. Um, um, and yeah, bottom, the bottom middle, that just shows you of um, like here, I'm sure that you sometimes you have to engineer your own, your own tools or your own jigs or your own devices to hold things. So that, uh, you can buy tiny little steadies for a lathe, but they're about this big. Or you can make them. I made my first one with MDF and my kids' roller blade wheels. But eventually I had this made by an engineer to um, basically to hold the weight. If you're turning things green, you, you turn a tenon on the end, you hold it in the chuck. And if it's uh, 60 centimeters long and still full of water, there's a real possibility that the the front end is going to start dropping and a millimeter off. And then when you're spinning it, mayhem. So this holds it, uh, it tries to hold it in place. I mean, it's still a bit bumpy, but it does. Okay, and I'm just going to run you very, very quickly through. Uh, very quickly, this is, uh, so this is my solo show. This is my solo show called Unearthed. Um, from after the pandemic, as soon as we opened, it kept getting delayed, but it, it was opened in 2021. Um, and I'm not going to well, we're here put you through Sarah this. Myers, so uh, I'm Corinne Julia. <laughs> <laughs> That's, um, this is, where are we? Oh yes, okay, this is a piece in the v and um, a column vessel. Oh, and I, I'm, I just put this because um, I love what the curator said. It's a piece that has just been acquired by the Museum of Arts and Design in New York. And um, if you've worked in either furniture or turning, then, um, or sculpting indeed, J.B. Blunk, um, then yeah, that's, and especially if you're a woman, that's a, a really nice quote. <laughs> okay, are we through? Okay, uh, this is a, a memorial I made to Oscar Wilde. The, uh, the trees outside Reading, Oscar Wilde was in jail in Reading in between 1895 and 1897. And at that time, there was a row of horse chestnut trees at the, on, on the edge of the wall of the jail and the branches kind of went into the jail. And just before the pandemic, they all had to come down because they were diseased and dropping on cars. And, um, and so they asked me to make a memorial to Oscar Wilde um, for Reading Museum. So that's that. We've already been there with um, Kate's introduction, so we won't bother with that. And just finally, I just wanted to say, this has been uh, my, my journey with, um, with wood and trying to find ways of um, uh, imbuing it with narrative and energy. And, um, and uh, like you, trying to experiment with it so that people want to, people are drawn into it. And for me, the ways in which we work material, the, the way we texture it or shape it or color it, um, it can have more than just the visual meaning or the physical meaning, it can have metaphorical meaning and, um, and it can make a, ple a piece much richer. And so I hope that's come across a little. And I, we can intensify the essence of a material by putting it in an unfamiliar context or imbuing it with, with narrative and story. And so I'm just interested to see later, or in maybe now to find out whether this is a consideration in your practice. And because as you think about how people are going to respond 
to a building and how it will be made meaningful for them. And that's thank it. You very much. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you, friends, for talking. It's actually not a question, and uh, uh, just like um, remind me of something I, I'm up to share. Yeah. So uh, when you were talking about the series of time and texture, it reminded me of my conversation with my friends that we were obsessed about at the time. So uh, there was a friend also um, studying sculpture, and uh, he was focusing on material and like the story that material can tell. Yeah. And we were talking about um, he he was looking into the cases of uh, Eskimos. I, I believe it is uh, Eskimos, maybe I think, uh, remember it wrong. Okay. Um, so uh, what, what they're having as a map is not what we have as a map. It's like flat a paper. What they have is like a holding stone. Um, and every family has their own stone. And that is their map. They sense the material. It's like a, something round and holding hands and there is like a um, texture on it. And they can tell the landscape by touching it. Maybe there's a, uh, a, a, a hole in there. Dip, yeah, yeah, yeah a dip, like, like that. Yeah. And because where they live um, is far from each other, like far yes. from another family. Yeah, yeah. Um, so every family, they have their own uh, language of how they, uh, the, the narrative of the environment. Yeah. So yeah, they, they just remind me. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it makes that, that language of touch. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. um, it's also about time and about texture. And another thing, when I, uh, I graduated uh, last year, uh, year uh, and I was looking into the park uh, narrative, um, yeah. and I was thinking about like the woods here um, was sort of uh, a time scale or a sort of witness of sort of the ruler of the environment. Yeah. Um, and um, like, so, so, like the woods here, their experience, like uh, how to say, like students come and go, and uh, architectural ideas, yeah, like happens yes. and then left. Yeah, so the, all the things, all the building was happened here. Maybe they will be taken away someday, but they was here one time. Yeah, and then that was about the uh, environment. Yeah, like, the part is sort of like piece of wood that you were carving. Yeah, I think it is. It's really interesting. And, and time, I mean, time just generally. So it, 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 it's kind of like a, it's a stretchy concept, isn't it? it? You know, it can mean different things at different times. Time, you know what I mean? It can stretch. And uh, I think it's quite interesting playing around with all those ideas. And that idea that you're, you're talking about is a really interesting. It's, it's like time and material. I think there's, there are lots of interesting ways that you can. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm just looking here at the table, you know, at, the, at, the, at your route coming up to the table, you know, that whole idea of how that is, um, you know, sort of a marker of, of, its, of its growth. You can see the rhythm of its growth. Yeah. yeah. It's really interesting. It's just a no, no, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, I think it is interesting. What would the time scale be? in one of those pieces of growth? Uh, well, they're, they're, yeah, they all, um, the very first tree was just not bird that I used. I, I kind of knew exactly the time because many of them grow in avenues up to, there was a, there was a real thing in sort of the 18th century to plant a row of horse chestnuts up to your very massive grand house. And so the very first tree I had had been planted in 1710. Um, on the way up to Bowton House um, in Northamptonshire. And so that was a really lovely start for me that whole, because I kind of knew the history of the tree. And so, um, yeah, uh, but, but it depends, but many of them are old. You know, when we were talking about, somebody was talking about a screw that was in the middle of a, a piece of wood. And I have a whole massive bowl full of uh, bits of iron and fishing hooks and, fence and nails that have been banged into a tree and then uh you know there's been 50 years of growth over the top of it so when i'm turning it you know it's, i run into it every now and then but uh yeah so uh but it, it really does depend and sequoia you know because of sequoia when when you get a sequoia that is sort of uh you know the diameter of this table um it's still probably only um you know 
100 years old or something or 50 years old because it's so massive and grows so quickly. So, uh, but it's really interesting that knowing the kind of having some idea of the history and the, the, the length of time these things have been around. But the, the thing I, that I really love about it actually is that it's got slightly light. And I think that's what I love about it. It just feels like live. I mean, it's not that big, it's compared to stone or something, it's sort of, you know, and it feels like it's living, doesn't it? You know, you feel the warmth of it. You know, you can still feel that characteristic. Quite interesting with this sculpture. It's hard to say when something is finished or not, but, but how, how do you think your pieces will evolve? Like, like, because it reacts to humidity and like, they, they will continue to crack. Is that something that you're yeah. interested in that you keep? Well, or, or? I think if you, I think if you make wood, I mean, if you make work with, um, you know, wood that is kind of uh, decaying in any way, and of course, just that burr has a really short shelf life. Once it's died, it has about nine months before it starts to become paper, basically. So um, it's a really short shelf life. You have to get it sort of sorted and dry in that point. Um, but you have to embrace the cracks, you know what I mean? You have to kind of go, that's just another sculptural opportunity. <laughs> because, uh, you know, that literally is part of it. And it, I think it's about, uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, it's part of the story, but you have to make it look intentional. You know, you can't just have some, you know, random crack that looks like a mistake. You know, I mean, things often are. I mean, accidents cause the best. Uh, Know, the best work always that's for sure but i mean it, it has to look intentional i think um do you, do you vacuum bag it then with the uh, oxalic acid so they kind of drinks deep into the no i know people do that i don't i i don't know it just feels too well first of all my pieces are too big you know we would be talking about a really massive bag you know at this point but if i okay. made smaller work i might i don't know there's something I mean, sometimes if it's really, really rotten, I go so far as to um, uh, put some wood hardener on it. You know, I'll go that far. But um, I, I'm, I'm not really interested in uh, it being completely. Uh, I mean, I have submerged. Have you said that? I, I had a piece that was full of woodworm, and I, I threw it out of my workshop when I kind of took the bark off it. And then I put it out outside in the yard under a table, and I left it there for a couple of years. And then in the pandemic, I kind of saw it and I thought, it's a bit of a shame. And so I, I kind of submerged it in a tank of woodworm fluid. And then when I took it out, it was really interesting because different parts of the wood had um, had reacted with the uh, woodwork fluid in a different way so some of it has, has, was white you know a bit like spalting so there were there were kind of like lines of spalting that had made sections so one section had gone kind of quite beige yellow and the other was still pristine white so i had so i i mean i do yeah i, I do certain things to try and hold on to it's more uh, important to you that the uh, the color is intrinsic and like enhance the properties and material it's more that those force. meanings come through you know yes it is and um uh, yeah and obviously, I have piles of wood that is unfortunately very beautiful, but very rotten in, uh, around the studio that I never can quite let go of. But yeah, well, like this, but uh, but in a much worse state. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Does the burr have to be taken off the tree once it's felled, or do you remove them? No, no. I, wait, I mean, I wait till the tree has had to be felled okay. for some reason. Then yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, I walk past trees with birds all the time, looking longingly. <laughs> but I do nothing to kind of make that happen. <laughs> it just wouldn't feel right. It would be lovely, but it wouldn't feel right. Uh, so no, I have to wait till they're felled. Um, and because I, you know, it is a kind of healing mechanism. It's a way of the tree kind of going, well, that's a bit uncomfortable, you know, and um, and sort of, you know, generating all this, generating this new growth to kind of grow over a limb that's been. Or whatever. So, uh, you know, to cut that off is just okay. Now nice start again. You know, it's it's like it doesn't it's not right really. So, uh, you know, I wait till trees come down, and then and then I use the burr, but with a whole pile of the tree as well, because that's the whole thing about how do you orientate it. If you do it one way, your burr's on the top. You do it the other way, it's around the side of the vessel. I mean, those are the decisions about you know about can how you, long. To when you're working with the burr, can you tell? 
You can if you find a big lump of metal that you <laughs> lump into your chisel. Or like but, uh, insects or... Yeah, you, yeah, you can sometimes, but uh, often you can't. Uh, and, and I'm sure, I mean, I don't know about this actually, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that there are probably all manner of reasons why a tree might be set off to burn, you know. Um, I certainly know about insects and certain disease, or, you know, that, that will just make it grow in a different way. But I can't tell, it's only metal is, you know, it's really easy to see a lot of sense. Right <laughs> and what's yeah. it trying to do? Expel it? No, it's just kind of kind of heal itself. It's a bit like a scar, I suppose. Uh, no, a scab. You know, it's just like a kind of a scar tissue. Yeah, it feels it feels to me a bit like if you imagine in a in a in an oyster and it gets a bit of sand in it and it's irritated, you know, and that produces a pearl. So that's how I kind of I, I feel like it's a it's a dynamic creative force of nature that um, I just think is fabulous. I mean, how amazing that that happens. And when I take the bark off, I'm like, oh my god, nobody's ever seen this before. You know, I'm just, it is like, kind of, I'm like archaeology, like taking off a layer to discover something. You probably answered this in that question, but I, I was going to ask how it was that you've kind of got, on a lot of the vessels you've kind of kept, at least for the way they're oriented for the photograph, there's, there's quite often one face which is the sort of perfect, there's a commons, yeah. silhouette. Yeah. Is, and is that something you, you tend to pick and orient the piece before you start turning it? So you, you Yes, I do, although it's sometimes it goes wrong, but I absolutely <laughs> do. And, and that can also go wrong because um, basically there's a kind of, an, a, there's, a, there's a point at which it all works, where you can understand the form, you can see it you know, immediately, you can see what the form should be. It isn't because of its, you know, I've, I've orientated it so it's going to fragment it. But if I do that, if I put it in the wrong place, for example, if I if I center the vessel too far into the tree, it's going to be really mostly perfect. Then I won't like it because um, it's too much looks like a you know like a proper <laughs> vessel. And then if I do it too much the other way, where I go too far to the edge, then you're really struggling to get either a top or a bottom or to actually make it work. So there is a kind of a there is a point at which it works uh, the best and. Um, and there is a point at which it doesn't work at all. But I don't like the ones that are too neat. And uh, yeah. Yeah, so there are, there are quite a few that don't work you know, for one reason or the other. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's that contrast thing again, which I'm sure is used, isn't it? I mean, in, um, in um, architecture, you know what I mean? That's smooth and, and rough. You know, that just putting things together that make you see both of them clearly, uh, more clearly. I think it needs that bit, right? Because then it's more. In it comes across as more intentional. Like if, if you're saying, exactly. like, I've proved I can do one it, bit. Exactly. It intensifies it. Yeah. It, it in, you know, it sort of draws you, your attention to both things. Yeah. How do you select the rules you are going to work with? And the process starts in the forest? Or... Uh, well, I, I wish that it was, you know, I had the, the problem is, is that it's, uh, it's a very narrow, you know, uh, boundaries I've chosen for myself. So I, I like horse chestnut burr because the colour is nearly, it nearly is like ivory and bony coloured already. And also when it starts to burr, it burrs really finely. So all those little tiny kind of hills, you know, those little tiny branches that didn't become a branch, they're very, very fine. And other trees you will see that burr in a much more rounded way. So, so horse chestnut burr is my kind of favourite burr. And, um, but I mean, I, I literally, I send about 400 emails to every sawmill tree surgeon in the country, and I literally find about one tree a year. Uh, and now obviously I try and buy the whole tree, uh, but it's, yeah, it's not, I mean, it's, it's sort of part of the search, it's part of it, I suppose. I find it tricky because obviously it makes me quite stressed <laughs> thinking, you know, I haven't got any material, but, um, but it is part of the process is to uh, to go and look at tree, you know, somebody will tell me there's a tree in, I mean, I chased trees sometimes for nine months. I chased the tree, the last tree I was working with, um, which was um, in Wooten Underwood House up in, uh, I think that is, um, and literally it was hit by lightning. It was obviously dead, it needed to come down, but then, I don't know whether it was Heritage England or somebody, you know, had put a slap the kind of thing on it because it was in the, the avenue going up to Water Underwood House. And so by the time it came down, um, it was, you know, just, 
that that work in the paper. Cool. So yeah, so it's a, there's always a story. I mean, uh, yeah, I can virtually for every piece I can virtually say it's the Reading, the Oscar Wilde. You know, it's that tree or it's the tree here. But I, I've had them from all over, from Cornwall, from you know, from all over the place up north. Is, is a burr the same as a as what we would refer to? You would call it a burr. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so it's a tricky thing. Sequoia, much easier. If you find a sequoia, so massive, lasts me for five years. So uh, yeah, much easier. I had a question about um, the relationship to other materials. Yes. Like you said, you did other like worked in plaster and clay. Yes. And also like the column being so. And then now made it wood. Yes. Like that kind of weird yes. relationship. I, I like that. I like that kind of. Well, I think working with, with other other materials was really it was really interesting. But what was really interesting was it literally made me think about wood uh, more than it did. Do you know what I mean? I just thought, oh, God, that's you know, it's not like wood. You know, wood does this. You know, so it was. But I think the the whole idea of there being slight ambiguity about the material is part of what I like. And I literally, I kind of burnish the pieces, or I, I sort of finish them, I sand them so finely that it begins to look a bit like alabaster or, or marble or something from a distance. And I like that idea that you have to be beckoned in, you have to be drawn in to kind of, you know, people are going, well, that's made of plaster, isn't it? And I'm like, no, it's not, you know, it's a plaster cast. No, it's not, you know, it's kind of like, feel it, you know, it's warm, it's warm. But, it, but I think that's an interesting thing that, you know, about anything, about sculpture, about architecture, whatever, you want to be drawn in, further in, you want to learn more about it, you don't want the whole story to be, you know, um, and, and I think that's, you don't want the whole story, well I don't, I don't want everything, you know what I mean, I don't want to look at something and go, right, well, I understand totally, that's it, because it doesn't hold my attention, you might grab my attention, but it won't hold my attention, and, um, and I think that's what I, I learned, the very first bowl I I showed you that sort of hemisphere bowl and I really loved that shape and I once saw something advertised in a gallery where they, somebody had made nine of those in this kind of dark Corian same shape and I thought oh, wow so I went to see it and and then I stood in front of it and it was really interesting for for a bit you know beautiful shape beautiful and then and then nothing it's kind of like but I I have the story they're all perfect they're in perfect alignment everything's perfect but I'm not gonna, there's nothing, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I've had enough already, you know, I, I'm, I've seen it in half an hour and, and I want to be able to look at something in two years time and still notice something I never noticed before, you know. And so, yeah, so it's part of that whole idea of, uh, yeah. No, I was just thinking there's an interesting thing about like classical architecture as that it started off as timber. Yeah. And then it got made into stone. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. now you're kind of- Yes, I'm going back with the third step of reprinting yes. the stone in yes. timber. Exactly, and I, I, yeah, it's, I think it's interesting those whole um, yeah. that story of material and how it's how things develop and go back and go forward and yeah. I guess when you're thinking here about making joints, you know, shall we use aluminium or shall we put a peg? You know, right? there's yeah, we're we're all. It's like that's what I'm saying about time. You know, everything is moving back. We we still use the past, don't we, to create new stuff? Um, and it's. We wouldn't be able to create the things we do without the past you know there's a continuum it's kind of like it's like vessels or it's like turning you know it's been done the same way for centuries but you can still find ways of, of using that and still be moving forward to the future yeah. we've got any questions online Can you guys online you mean there was one. Oh, emma emma go for it She can't unmute. Then, um, okay, great. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Then. thank you. Um, hello. Uh, yeah, that was um really beautiful talk, and I loved um what you were saying at the beginning about your first sculptural memory. Um, and it actually reminded me of a previous talk with uh, Tezuka Architects where he, I think it was a chapel that he made um, with the memory of, of his experience of being in the forest and the light. 
<laughs> and it was um i have a picture here from my notebook <laughs> it was something like like this yep you can see okay yeah 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 and it was just so lovely and um i wondered um now that um you live in the city um mm -hmm and um and you're an adult um how you keep those memories alive how you keep um that kind of freshness of the feeling of it and also um is it important for you to make new memories um by uh, travel seeing new places that kind of thing? yeah yeah well well the the thing about um keeping things alive i think it just happens um automatically it's almost like you know, I, I, in order to sort of talk about my work over the last few years, I've obviously had to try and work out. You know, most of the work I do is kind of instinctive. You know, I just, uh, it's just, I just do it. But it's obviously you, you have to reflect on what you're doing. And then, you know, I realize that there's not much changed in the way I feel about material, the things I'm interested in, or the, the things I want to make from when I was seven. You know what I mean? That's a sort of like, more than 50 years you know it, and but I, I just don't think that it isn't like I've tried to hold on to anything it's just that that is the case and I, I, I have no idea how people's experiences what they've seen how that all kind of comes out as you know it, it's it's just we've all got this sort of complete mixture of stuff we love stuff we've seen stuff we respond to and then it's um but you I think I think uh, I definitely still have to kind of go and be inspired. You know, I spend a lot of time going to um, museums and looking at other work and not just in wood. I look at work in every other material because I find it, um, you know, you kind of have to fill yourself up. You know, you, you've been make, 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 and then you have to go and kind of, yeah, you have to go and rejuvenate your, your ideas or your, you don't want it to be static. You know, you want to be looking at different things. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I still do that a lot. Uh, yeah, all the time. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Thanks. Have we got any other questions online? Um, <clears throat> we may need to wrap things up here because uh, yeah. we need to eat lunch. Yes. <laughs> we all eat lunch together. So um, okay. oh, well. I just want to know, we can carry on this conversation to the afternoon. Ellen is staying with us for the MR jury, which should start at about 2.30 on the same link um, if you want to um, drop back in after we've had our lunch. Um, we'll be somewhere different, we'll be in the big shed with all the models and prototypes. And um, big thank you, um, honestly amazing. And I think Chasing Trees, like the documentary, <laughs> 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 if you haven't made it already. Thanks a lot. <laughs>